It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Dan Patterson is here from CBS News, from The Protocol, protocol.com, Owen Thomas, from Consumer Reports, uh, my favorite magazine, been a longtime member, uh, Nicholas DeLeon. We've got lots to talk about. Meta lo losing more value. in the It's the biggest stock wipeout in history this week. They say it's Apple's fault, is it? We'll talk about Google breaking $200 billion in annual revenue for the first time. Silicon Valley and the Mafia. <laughs> Self-driving software that runs stop signs. And North Korea hacked him, so he took down their internet. All that and more coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week at Tech, episode 861, recorded Sunday, February 6th, 2022. Magic Internet Money. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Linode. With Linode, there are no hidden fees, and you can scale up or down without penalty. Get $100 in credit by visiting linode.com slash twit. And by Podium. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free at podium.com slash twit or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. And by Our Crowd. Our Crowd helps accredited investors invest early in pre-IPO companies alongside professional venture capitalists. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at OurCrowd.com slash twit. And by Nureva. Traditional audio conferencing systems can entail lots of components, installation can take days, and you might not get the mic coverage you need. That's complex expensive. But Nareva Audio, it's easy to install and manage, no technicians required, and you get true full room coverage. And that's easy economical. Learn more at Nareva.com. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. And uh, I've got a good panel, as always, to join us. Nicholas DeLeon is here. I'm sorry, DeLeon. I always say it wrong. Uh, it's uh, De Leon, actually. De Leon. But thank you. Yeah. So the yes. third chimes the charm. Hi, Nicholas, senior reporter for uh, Electronics Reporter for Consumer Reports. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank De you. Leon. De Leon. Yep. You say it properly. Is I should just say that. It's a real struggle. You know, when I was a kid, it, you know, De Leon, it, it's yeah. pronounced De Leon. I think folks can handle three syllables, to be honest with you. So, I think we De can do it. De Leon. We'll do it. We'll do it. Thank Owen, Owen Patterson is also here. He is. <laughs> Dan Patterson is here. <laughs> Technology reporter, CBS News. Dan, always good to see you. Welcome. You too. Yep. You'll see Thanks. him on the uh, streaming service of CBS News, which is bigger, brighter, and better than ever. A lot of effort being put into that right now. Also, speaking of new publications, Owen Thomas is back. He is at Protocol celebrating two years. Uh, and it's still free, no paywall. You're still happy with that? Yeah, we've you know we've talked about uh, paid products on the road, but um, it still seems like early days right now for that. It's a great resource. I use it all the time. Thank uh, you. We quote you all the time. In fact, we're going to quote you about Meta. <laughs> Just three seconds. I you know there's so many uh, places we could begin here. I could continue with the Joe Rogan saga, which gets wilder and wilder as we go. Uh, but I think we should talk about Meta. Uh, the company formerly known as Facebook, which suffered the biggest stock market loss, biggest wipeout, as Bloomberg put it, in history this week. Uh, shares went down 26%, which is a $251 billion change in value. I want to, though, be clear, and I'd love to hear what you all think about this. This is... This didn't come out of Mark Zuckerberg's pocket. This is not, they don't have a bill for $251 billion they have to pay. This is the stock market valuing the company. 
you know, it's shareholders, I guess, who will lose money. Not, and you know, to the extent that Mark's a shareholder, I guess that means his his stock is worth less. And I think some of this is because uh, analysts had, you know, were disappointed, which seems like a terrible reason to take value off the company. Oh, and do you think uh, Facebook Meta is worth less in in reality or just on the stock market? I mean, what is real, Leo? You know. <laughs> NFTs, baby, that's what's real. I mean, what, what's the difference between a share of stock and an NFT? It's all like a belief. That's a good point. Right? It's fiat it, currency. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, a, a share is a um, is a, a theoretical claim on the future earnings of a company. So I think what what people were scared about here was not the present, you know, how Facebook is doing, you know, Meta, how Meta is doing as a company right now, but the future, the fact that users of the Facebook app, you know, the blue app actually dropped. Um, First time ever. Was, right. And also usage, you know, I think the, you know, the death spiral is not just people like quitting the service or not, you know, Facebook not replacing users. It's losing fast enough. It's, you know, it's usage. And I think that's, I think Facebook is really scared of TikTok as as they should be. Yeah. I mean, this should have been in the stock all along because uh, we know young people don't really use Facebook. It's it's their parents' social network. They use TikTok or Snap or something else. Um, they maybe they use Instagram, which is Facebook's, you know, holding action against the youth. Um, Facebook took I think Facebook actually did a really interesting thing. They took advantage of this moment to blame Apple. <laughs> they, they, they said, it's Apple's fault. We lost $10 billion because of the checkbox in, you know, that you now get on iPhones where it says, you want to let this company track you. Uh, I don't think they can actually demonstrably prove that that was where the loss was. In fact, the $10.2 billion loss came from the Reality Labs. It's VR efforts which have uh, been very, very expensive with, of course, very little uh, revenue. Um, well, those are, all of those are two. Are, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Those no, are two no, go things. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. There's, um, you know, there, there's the hard cost of investing in AR and VR. And then I think the 10, the other $10 billion, I mean, and, you know, 10 billion here, 10 billion there, pretty, pretty soon you're talking about real money. The other $10 billion was missed revenue. Right. Like revenue that they could have gotten but didn't get right um so i think that there actually are like two separate chunks and like you add that up that's a 20 billion dollar delta am i crazy I though dan to say that uh facebook would like you to blame apple uh but in fact facebook what really doesn't facebook doesn't want you to know is they have perfectly good other means of tracking you they don't need apple's id for advertisers and turning that off is actually meaningless from their point of view but they would like to pretend it seems to me that that that's oh it's killing me it's killing me well i don't mean this in the in the cultural sense but i i think all of these issues are real substantial and intersectional um i talk to people at facebook who genuinely think that the and they they will stay off record uh they genuinely think that the changes in ios 14.5 and 15 uh did kneecap them or at least in the very short term but i think that the larger picture is certainly this drop in usage, which they have tried to duck into this or roll into this pivot to VR. So all of those things intersect with each other and all of them as the end result, not just result in losing money, but a loss of influence because that's really what money is, right? It's influence, power. The daily active users went from 1.93 billion to 1.929 billion. <laughs> now, admittedly, uh, what is that? That's a lot of millions. That's uh, like a million. But when you have 1.9 billion <laughs> users, I think it's almost a rounding error. Uh, should we, Nicholas, what do you think? Is it over? Should we just throw in the towel? Should Facebook go home? I... I don't know if Facebook is coming. I I have this conversation with with my bosses and my friends all the time. Like, have we reached peak tech? Uh, you know, I I do wonder what like Gen Z like. Are they 
Are they so, do they even remember a time before technology? Are they over this stuff? Do they not care? Is it not cool anymore? Uh, you know, if you're, if you're a parent and you're thinking of sending your kids to college, do you want them to pursue a career in tech? Uh, have we reached peak tech? I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I, I was recently in Puerto Rico for a family thing. Uh, and I would say, uh, just seeing, hanging out with friends and family down there, Facebook, meaning the big blue app, uh, is still, uh, heavily used. And uh, certainly WhatsApp, right? Oh yeah. WhatsApp. I, it, it's funny when, uh, I, I've probably sent like f five I messages in my life. Actually. Uh, I, I'm on WhatsApp all day talking to my family. So yeah. I, I kind of have a slightly different uh, perspective on like the messaging wars, I guess. But yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know if, if, I don't know, people are just over tech. I don't know, especially the past two years of looking into Zoom calls and, and all this stuff. Are people just burnt out? Uh, I, I don't know, but I, I think it's a very interesting question. I obviously don't know the answer. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I guess we'll see. You know, I guess Zuck is trying to pivot to the metaverse, which uh, I, I don't know how that will go. I, I suppose I'm, I'm more inclined to be cool with that as a, as, a, as a big gamer and as a huge nerd. It's like, that's neat to me. But like, is my adopted mom going to sit there with a, AR or VR headset all, no, she's not. That's never going to happen. Uh, so I don't know. V very interesting uh, series of events here. I think you're right. I think the stock market anyway says we're at peak tech and it's over and we got to find something else. I should point out though, if you bought into Facebook when it IPO'd, you're, you're far from underwater. You're, you've still made more than 250 bucks a share since the IPO. Uh, as my wife keeps telling me, <laughs> so, so so I I it's not it's not the end of the world for Facebook, I, and I often wonder when you see these kinds of drops. Apple lost almost two hundred billion dollars in twenty twenty, and by the way, that would have been a good time to buy some Apple stock because not only did it recover, it kept on growing. I often wonder, you know, Monday is the stock market going to say, okay, we had our sell off, let's uh, let's let's back to business as usual. So that's the real question for me. I don't care about the stock market so much, but the real question for me is, is this a bellwether? Is it the beginning of the end for Facebook? Is Facebook going the way of MySpace? Uh, are they going to be able to make a pivot to augmented reality? Clearly Zuckerberg feels like it. He's, he actually had an all hands the day after the stock tumble. He, uh, his eyes were red and watery, but he told everybody it was because of a scratched cornea, according to Bloomberg, who had unnamed persons at the event uh he apparently uh you know repeated what he'd already said to in the in the earnings call that it was uh, the rise of tiktok uh unprecedented level of competition is the phrase uh reels competing with instagram uh, but he also said i want you all uh to focus on video that this is the future uh, and I, I guess, does he mean video as in VR? Turned out great last time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their, their uh, homegrown video platform was a terrible flop, right? And not just well, for it, Facebook, but for media companies as well. Yeah, Microsoft flopped uh, with, with Mixer. Uh, Facebook spent a lot of money to bring creators over. That didn't go anywhere. Well, Facebook also, I mean, the last time they did a pivot to video, they, a couple, maybe 18, 36 months afterwards, they said, oops, we, yeah. we did a miscalculation, which caused companies like Mike to just vanish overnight. Yep. I guess that's one issue with this is uh, it could be that the tremors will be felt throughout the tech market, as you say, Nicholas, because Facebook is so kind of pivotal to, for news organizations, for, for everybody, uh, in driving traffic that a uh, failed Facebook might be bad in general for the tech industry. So maybe that, maybe that's what we're seeing. I, I, I know I find it hard to write them off at this point. Well, and they're a platform, like unlike MySpace. I mean, those, the comparisons to a previous era of tech are just not the same. That's true. It's not MySpace. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Um, well, anyway, there's the, there's the meta, <laughs> the meta story. <laughs> Such as it is, it's a great number though. Two hundred fifty-one billion dollars in value. That does hurt in a couple of ways. It makes it harder to attract talent because, of course, you pay them in stock options. So it hurts in that way. It might be, make it harder to raise money if they needed to. So there, it's not it's not a neutral e event for from their point of view at Meta, and it's a bad headline. But I don't think it means that they're necessary. I mean, 
1.9 billion daily active users. That's pretty successful. You know, one point about attracting talent, they have had problems attracting engineering talent. And in the Valley, their reputation is pretty bad, at least when it comes to engineering talent. But on the other side, although we talk about all the losses, the $10 billion in, in the, um, the their meta component, they've attracted a ton of people from Microsoft, a ton. And the HoloLens people are pretty pissed off right now because they kill HoloLens 3. Um, so they've done a very good job of attracting talent, experienced talent when it comes to AR, VR, and XR. Yeah. I, I I have to think though that you know part of the problem here is like Mark Zuckerberg is saying, hey, we're not the Facebook company anymore. We're Meta, AR and VR is where it's at. So if you're working at Meta on the Facebook app, you've got to feel like you're a second class citizen, right? Like you're not taken yeah. seriously, even though you bring in all the money. And that's got to hurt morale. Like, how are they going to hire you know engineers to to work on? you know, fixing misinformation or optimizing ads or, you know, dealing with the Apple, you know, the Apple ID issue. That's that's where I think they're going to feel the pinch. Although, remember, Apple is paying $180,000 bonuses to its engineers not to go to Facebook. So it is a cutthroat competition in Silicon Valley for engineering talent. If you're good, you, you know, you can write your own ticket. So all of these companies are trying to keep people... Uh, not just not just Facebook, and I don't think Facebook's uh, the only company losing talent either. I think people just move around to kind of increase their value. Alexis Ohanian, I don't know if he's the expert on this. He's a VC now. Did found co-found uh, Reddit. Said, uh, "Oh, we all knew this was going to happen." <laughs> <laughs> he told Bloomberg, uh, "Facebook ad product just doesn't cut the mustard anymore. The savviest marketers have started ditching Facebook for advertising." Uh, that might be the case. I don't think it has to do with Apple, to be honest with you. I think Facebook has plenty of ways of knowing who's watching what on their platform. But uh, is it the case, do you think, that advertisers are turning their back on Facebook, that it's no longer the place to go? That would surprise me. What do you think, Nicholas? I... Well, one thing I will say is that the I never get better ads than I get on Instagram. Yeah. Um, my my interests are are pretty explicit. I'm into soccer. I said this part of soccer, video game stuff, uh, watches. Those are pretty much my three things. And every ad on Instagram is related to one of those three things. Uh, and I've definitely purchased uh, several items off Instagram. So I don't know how they do it. You know, I have a mixture of like, don't follow me, don't track, uh, ad blocker. I, I I try to put up a fight, I guess. And and yet. Uh, the ads on Instagram are, are pretty good. So I don't know if marketers, I don't know, they seem to be having a pretty good time, at least I over think at Instagram. Be nuts to abandon either Facebook or Instagram. Fa I, you know, look, we sell ads. That's how we make a living. And uh, I've constantly worried about Facebook and Google just eating up the ad space and now Amazon because they have so much more information about the audience. We don't know anything about the audience. Uh, and I don't think Facebook's knowledge has gotten any worse thanks to Apple. I think that's a, a little bit of a misdirection. I think where it, where it hurts uh, Facebook, from from what I understand, is tracking a purchase. So you get shown this great Instagram ad, and it pushes you off to a website, and Facebook no longer can tell if you are, um, you know, if you actually like click buy. Oh there. wait a minute! You don't think so? Remember, Google was telling uh, advertisers, oh, by the way, we can tell uh, how many you sold because we got the credit card data as well. All of this stuff is sold to data brokers and sold on, isn't it? Don't they know everything anyway? Do you really think Facebook is in the dark about what you did? Yeah, Facebook, Facebook's payments features have been, you know, uh, like they've always had trouble getting those kind of universally accepted. You know, I, I still don't see a lot of like, um, even though in theory you can use your Facebook account, I think, to buy on some stores, I don't see a lot of merchants uh, no, actually adopting that. But I don't think you have to. I think that the, if you use a, just use a credit card, that information will filter back to Facebook. Eventually, the merchant, the merchant can link it up, but yeah. does Facebook know? And, if there's, and I think a like, Facebook's if there's a like button or a Facebook bug of any kind on those pages, they know that you went there. I think Facebook. Uh, but on mobile, that that's that's a desktop feature, right? So on mobile, all those links get broken, and that's where Facebook's vulnerable. Do they? 
The ID, oh, the only thing that button on uh, Apple does, by the way, is turn off the ID for ad advertisers so that, that that information, that unique code is not transmitted. Uh, but doesn't mean that Facebook doesn't see like buttons. Is that stopped by uh, Safari? I know I, I use uh, Firefox and it stops them. I don't know, does Safari stop them? Uh, Safari has a private-ish feature, right? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's that like private. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think ish, that, Leo, ish. ish. I don't think that's that private. I think these days fingerprinting is so good. I don't, I think it's a, I don't know. It's a safe assumption uh, that you're, what you're doing is pretty well known by everybody on the web, whether or not you click that button on the IDFA. In fact, there's some, re, there have been a number of research studies that uh, back that up over the last six months. So, yeah, if you're running an ad blocker, but I don't think uh, most people run ad blockers yet. I don't know. I think this is interesting. We'll see. Is it the beginning of the end for big tech? I, now, government is making some inroads. Congress uh, is moving pretty quickly on a number of, of fronts. They uh, have it came out of, went out of committee, the... Uh, 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 I'm I'm blanking out Congress. That's good. That's a good thing. I can't remember uh, her name. This our senator from Minnesota. Uh, her bill, Amy Klobuchar. Robert thank Shire? you. Yeah, her uh, her bill to uh, and I think it was Marsha Blackburn was a co-sponsor to force a. And by the way, the bill was written with like a paragraph per company. It was very clear who they were aiming at: Google, Apple, uh, to force these third-party app stores. Uh, and I think that may well pass uh, in both the Senate and the House and go on to be law. There's also a very concerning bill that is back, the Earn It Act, uh, uh, which is a terrifying uh, bill, which was, we beat once last summer, but Senator Dick Blumenthal and Lindsey Graham have reintroduced the bill. We beat it actually in 2020. Um that will, according to the EFF, pave the way for a massive new surveillance system run by private companies. Just in time. It, it would roll back some of the most... This is EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Apple, by the way, agrees. It would roll back some of the most important privacy and security features in technology. Uh, it, it's a framework for private actors to scan every message sent online. And, and the premise, of course... Think of the children. The premise is, of course, that we've got to stop uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse material. And so companies need to be held responsible for every bit of traffic on their network. Uh, the Earn It Act could also ensure that anything hosted online, backups, websites, cloud photos is scanned. Remember the, the fight over Apple scanning stuff on your iPhone? Well, get ready. It also weakens encryption. And here's a scary thing about the Earn It Act. It has strong bipartisan support. It, uh, this act matches an act, a similar uh, law that is uh, in front of the House right now. The bill creates a 19-person federal commission. What could possibly go, go wrong? Which is mostly uh, run by law enforcement agencies, which will lay out voluntary best practices for attacking the problem of online child abuse. Uh, the real concern from a lot of people is this will actually just force child abuse uh, underground where it will continue unabated, meanwhile leaving us in a much less secure and private state. Um, so just to a little be aware of CSAM. It also uh, changes uh, Section 230, which is a big issue. In fact, Mike uh, Masnick, who's a big 230 supporter on Tech Dirt, had a number of uh, pieces, I think three, talking about the... Uh, the dangers of the uh, Earn It Act. Any thoughts, uh, Dan Patterson, on Earn It? I think anytime we talk about changing 230, it's bad. I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, no, I, it's the I them I can't. Part of me, can't, <laughs> I can't. I can't tell you my opinions on policy, but I think uh, weakening encryption, changing 230, bad. Mike's uh, headline in the Tech Dirt is how the Earn It Act is significantly more dangerous than FOSTA, FOSTA, which did pass. Uh, he says, it, Earn It repeats the basics of the FOSTA playbook. But, and this is very important, 
since Earn It appears to have significant momentum in Congress, it's significantly more dangerous in multiple different ways that necessarily haven't necessarily been highlighted. I, um, I will say, you know, we can't lobby Facebook. We can't lobby Google. We can lobby the government. So if we find these policies noxious, lobby the government. Yeah. Or vote. Yeah. Or vote or both. Or both. Yeah. Actually, both might sounds pretty good right about now. Uh, all right. I do find it interesting, Leo, that that all of these laws, not just not just earn it, but uh, you know, there's another one about ending platform monopolies. Yeah, that's they the have these, like, bill. Yeah, they have these really arbitrary cutoffs. You know, like oh, if you exceed six hundred billion dollars in market cap, then you know, then we're going to take away your section. Oh, it's totally protection. aimed at big tech. Yeah, right. Well. Facebook almost slipped below that. So, like, are they, you know, like, on a Monday, are they going to be exempt oh. from it? And on Tuesday, are they going to be oh, subject to it? Oh, that's like, have interesting. They, have they thought about how what any of thought. this works? Oh, that's you really know? interesting. No, and, no. and another one was, like, $600 billion in revenue or $600 billion in market cap. And I'm like, you don't – you at Congress don't understand the relationship that's between revenue difference. and market cap, <laughs> do you? No, <laughs> it said either even or. <laughs> even Walmart doesn't have six hundred billion dollars in, in revenue, so no. it like it would apply to literally no one. I mean, these things, you know, these things do get worked out through the amendment process, and like you know, the most glaring kind of, you know, oopsies uh, tend to get fixed. But yeah. I still think it's worth pointing out, like, you know, that that's a big tell to me that like there's not sophisticated thinking about market structure going into these laws. And yeah, that's, that's yeah, disturbing. Yeah. Um, Facebook is on the order of a hundred billion a year revenue, something like that. Uh, profit's pretty good though, by the way. Uh, don't, don't worry about Facebook. Their, their profit is still in the $30 billion a quarter range. It's doing all right. Uh, Alphabet uh, quarterly results came out as well, and Alphabet broke two hundred billion in annual revenue for the first time. So uh, they did. Alphabet did not take this opportunity to blame Apple for anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Missed opportunity there. Uh, for twenty twenty one, the full year, forty one percent year over year jump in revenue for Alphabet. Unbelievable. Fourth quarter revenue seventy five point three billion. That's up thirty two percent year over year. Advertising revenue for the quarter sixty one point two five billion. Apparently, um, you know, Apple didn't hurt them, but I think at Google and I think Facebook's in the same boat. Have plenty of ways to get information about you. Google uh, and they have Android. Yeah, they have Android. They have Chrome, which is the dominant browser. They have, you know, YouTube, and they have Search. So you're sending them plenty of signals. YouTube adds 8.63 billion in revenue in the fourth quarter. Of course, there's always the other bets, which always it's always fun. Google makes so much money in Search, and then they spend it all on Waymo and Verily. Uh, other bets, 181 million in revenue, but I think a substantial uh, loss. Cloud, uh, loss of 890 million. So, these are. I'm sorry. I. It's boring, isn't it? Who cares about money? I don't care about money. It's boring. I care about money. No money. <laughs> money's awesome. You know? <laughs> I, I'm team money. <laughs> uh, pick, I'll tell you. This is a. This is something. It's money related. It came from Google's quarterly results, but their Pixel phones had their best sales quarter ever, which probably isn't saying that much given that they've not been yeah. huge sellers in general. Sundar Pichai uh, in the earnings call said, in Q4, we set an all-time quarterly sales record in spite of an extremely challenging supply chain environment. I just got, speaking of supply chain, I ordered when the Pixel 6 came out I ordered a Pixel 6. I got that pretty quickly. I ordered the case, which I just got yesterday. <laughs> Four months after I ordered it. But I got it. Thank God I didn't drop the phone in between uh, now and then. I think it's the first Google phone, just anecdotally, that I see in the wild routinely. You see a lot of Pixel 6s? 
I don't know about a lot, but I, I think on a weekly basis. Yeah. Which I, I can't recall on any other Pixel phone. So, yeah. I mean. They don't break out sales figures, so we just have to go by uh, Pachai's claim that it's the largest yet. But, you know, double nothing is still nothing. It doesn't compare with the iPhone or Samsung's uh, phones at all. All right, let me take a break. I'm going to find something that's going to get you excited. We could talk about Joe Rogan. How about that? I got to find <laughs> something. <laughs> Good help That's guy. money. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not money. Well, it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's a hundred million dollar guy. A hundred million dollar guy, yeah. I just wanted to add on the point of Google making money hand over fist. Uh, about a decade ago, I had some free Google host. I own my own domain, dayleon.org, spelled phonetically. Uh, and I had it hooked up to uh, Google for Enterprise. I got one free email address uh, hosted by Gmail, basically. Uh, not Enterprise. Anymore, so it's Nicholas buddy. at dayleon. Yes, exactly. Uh, I got an email like two weeks ago saying, oh, remember that free single email address we gave you a decade ago? Well, now we're going to charge you. Yeah. And it's like $7 a month for email. So I'm like, A, uh, don't you make enough money, Google? And B, the only thing that that email did, I'm obviously not paying $7 a month for email. I'm like George Costanza. I was like, you're not winning. Uh, so all <laughs> I did was maybe figure out like an alternative hosting arrangement. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to go with iCloud or whatever because yeah. I already pay for that. But I'm like, like the greed of like how many people could have had that free, you know, is it a million? Almost certainly not. Uh, and you need an additional $7 a pop for the, like, it's just, it is, uh, it was very disappointing. And it made me really question, like, do I really, like, what else do, don't I need from Google uh, or from Amazon or from any of these guys? It's like that, like, just to make an extra, you know, a couple dollars a month, I'm just reevaluating my entire relationship with all these guys. That's how, like, that's how, like, uh, that's how I work, I guess. No, I understand. This I is did just the same thing. One more, iCloud. one more thing that Google's switching off. So you had the the one free email uh, as well. No, I was paying for um, Google services and got a very similar email uh, right. saying they were raising the price on it. Um, and I, I mean, I did a, this was 2018. I did a story on it. Just the process of quitting Google. How I quit Google services. It took my entire Thanksgiving week to like order, like put in, in like prioritize what Google services are important. Oh, geez, there's all these uh, photos backed up and then to export everything, to kill everything. And I still have nagging Google services following me around. So it's, it is a process, uh, but I did just put everything on iCloud and uh, Cloudflare. A anyway, Nick, the exact same mindset and process. Yeah. iCloud is okay. not the, not Google I want to yeah. point out, Dan, this is not your first rodeo. It's not the first time you've tried to quit Google. This is no, from that's 2019. What I'm 20 <laughs> uh, that's that's a, a, a newer post of the the same old story. Oh, okay. But yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. It, I mean, I've tried. To, I nuked Facebook services, and to do a story on Oculus, I had to to start a Facebook account. I mean, it, it is incredibly hard if you want to quit big tech. It's really hard. Sorry, so, Nick. I didn't mean to hijack. Your, no, 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 your it just it just points. sort of triggered my consumer reports finding the best deal, and I yeah. I hope we talk about the Amazon Prime increase maybe later in the show because that did oh, a similar thing. I'm like, yeah. where's my money going? What yeah. services am I paying for? How do I how do I min max to That's put it a, in like World of Warcraft terms? Exactly. Yes. Uh, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. This is yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so so it's not money that's the problem. It just has to be the right topic of money, and we're going to get right down to it. Min maxing your yes. <laughs> your uh, investment in Amazon Prime. Oish. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. We've got a good panel. It's going to be fun. Dan Patterson's here from CBS. Just CBS. CBS News, right? CBS News. CBSnews.com. Slash live. Slash live. <laughs> got to get the slash. What happens if I don't do the slash live? The old stuff? You, get new. You, you still get news. Yeah, you still get news. And there's a button on there that says live, so you can go live. You can do that too. Yeah, yeah. okay. CBSnews.com slash live. Uh, It'd be better if it was not biz. But. <laughs> it's great to see you. Uh, also with us, Owen Thomas, great to have you from Protocol. He's a senior editor over there, long friend, long time friend, uh, and uh, always great to have you on. And kind of relatively new to the group, Nicholas de Leon, who's uh, been on many times now. You're no longer the newbie, but uh, yeah, it's great to have you. That's okay. Yeah, senior electronics reporter for Consumer Reports. Speaking of old times, I remember when Linode first started, well, gosh, when was that? In the early 2000s. It was so cool. They were one of the first cloud uh, infrastructure companies to offer 
SSDs, running Linux. Man, it was awesome. Well, Linode has, is all grown up, man, and it is awesome. It's the industry's best price-to-performance value for all compute instances. Whatever you're doing, shared, dedicated, high memory, doing uh, artificial intelligence, GPUs too. You get free DDoS protection, free cloud firewall, unfiltered API access, and more. From Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E, the original. They started three years before AWS, and they're still famous for predictable flat fee pricing, uh, universal across all 11 of their data centers. No weird tiering, no weird regions. You just choose Linode because it's the best. You get support better than any because the people who work at Linode are like us. They understand. They're there to help. I, you know, the interaction's always great. People choose Linode who want a better customer support experience because they're independent and, and they, their mission is keep the customer happy. No matter what tier, no matter what level, no matter how much they spend, you are not a number to them. You are the reason they're there, the driving force behind everything they do. Their pricing is transparent. It's predictable. It's pay as you go. They really started predictable flat pricing for cloud computing and they're still the, the leader in this. No more anxiety over hidden costs, weird egress fees, things like that. They make it simple to launch and scale in the cloud with Linode. Your flat pricing is the same across every global data center. You get an incredible cloud manager. It's very easy to use. Um, there's a full-featured API, great documentation, award-winning support. And it's secure, it's proven, it's reliable. It's enterprise-grade infrastructure. I think that's the one thing... You know, because I've been on Linode so long, it's not a hobbyist thing. It is for me because, you know, I use it for projects and, you know, practicing coding, things like that. But it is enterprise-grade infrastructure, and so many people use it to run their apps, to run their sites, for backup, for CI, CD, for AI, for gaming services. Their peering relationships are extensive. They've been in this business a long time. They peer with everyone. Their next-generation network gives you the modern infrastructure and performance you need to innovate at scale. You could choose shared or dedicated compute instances. We're going to give you a $100 credit. You can use it on that. You can use it on S3 compatible object storage. Yes, that's nice because uh, your S3 software will work with it. You already know how it works. Managed Kubernetes. Yes, they've got that. Virtual machines. As much power as you need or not. Linode was rated easiest to use by G2 Crowd in 2021. That's why cloud developers choose Linode because they make managing complex cloud infrastructure easy. Simple bundled pricing, full featured API, 100% human support. They've been doing this for a long time, since 2003. So they've got the longevity you know. They know it. They've been in this business a long time. No hidden fees, scale up or down without penalty. And right now get $100 credit. When you go to linode.com slash twit, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash twit. I'm a big fan, using them for years. Linode, give it a try. And we thank them so much for supporting This Week in Tech. You support us too when you use that address, linode.com slash twit. So what about it? We can do Amazon Prime. What about Amazon Prime? A uh, $20 bump, right, in a yearly fee. Yeah, And it kind of makes me mad because they say, uh, well, we got to pass along costs. And it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> what am I, what exactly am I paying for? Is it, is it prime video? Is that, is that why Amazon prime's going up? Is it your rocket to the moon, Jeff? Is it your new yacht that they're going to dismantle a bridge in Holland for? What exactly am I paying for? I think the mistake of going up by that much, $140 a year, is that it does make people think about it and say, is it worth what I'm getting? What did you decide, Nicholas? Yeah, well, I was I spent several hours, I guess the day after that was announced, kind of researching, you know, get the sentiment online. What are people feeling about this? You know, maybe, maybe or maybe not, we will do a story on, on uh, you know, reevaluating your relationships to all these companies. But uh, 
I think the thing it triggered in people, like I said earlier, was that it, it just kind of like, what am I paying for? You know, $20 a year is less than $2 a month, uh, which I'll say two things about, because I saw a lot of comments about this too. Oh, it's only $2. Okay, well, A, that's not the point. And B, uh, you know, this is something that's drilled into me from being a consumer reports. It's like people have budgets. Money does not grow on trees, whether it's $2 or $2,000. Uh, people have money allocated that they spend every month. And for you to ask all of a sudden, well, here's an extra $2 a month. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe most people can swing that, but it's, but maybe they can't. So that's one thing. Uh, and then when they try to justify it by saying, oh, well, we have the NFL on Thursdays. Uh, I don't know if there's a thing on this planet I care less about yeah, than the I don't, NFL. I don't want to help pay for the <laughs> NFL. I don't care. If the NFL disappears tomorrow, I'll be like, what are you even talking about? So that, and I suspect a lot of nerds are the same way. This is not relevant to me in the slightest. Uh, Now, I will say, uh, at the end of all of that, I kind of, I did run the numbers and what services am I paying for? Spotify and Cobuzz and Google One Storage. I did all the math. And it, as it turns out, for someone literally with my specific uh, set of services, uh, it does make sense to keep Prime. Uh, if anything else, it makes sense to go even further into the Amazon ecosystem because I can sa- I personally can save money by doing Prime and Amazon Music Unlimited because they have the hi-fi that saves me from having to pay for Spotify or Cobuzz. They're, they're very, very specific reasons, but it's the type of thing where it's like you should go over with a fine-tooth comb who are you giving money to every single month? I get the sense that a lot of consumers out there, ah, $5 here, five, they don't really think of it. But I, I'm here to tell you that stuff adds up. And all these little streaming services they want you to subscribe to to watch the Flavor of the Month television show, which is invariably, who cares? It's great. Let's say it's great. Whatever. Uh, it's like these things cost money and money doesn't grow on trees. So I really do think that asking people, you know, a little more, a little more, a little more. Uh, it may just backfire because I, I don't know that people are going to put up with it. It, it, it certainly is. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're a family with 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 uh, with never mind inflation, never have, have you bought like a pound of ch- chicken breast recently uh, or milk? Like prices are going up very very high, and for and it, now Prime wants more money. I, I don't know. It's very. I don't think it's a good look, especially given how much money uh, Amazon made. Uh, through the pandemic and through this recent quarter, now they're like an advertising juggernaut. So you want an extra two dollars a month out of me? Why don't you just, you know, it, it just it just smells fishy. So that that's that's my. It's also <laughs> I, the case that Prime made sense when it was because it was free second day shipping, when you would always get that. But a lot of times now you don't. And <laughs> no, I, I will say in the past year I've had several packages uh, delayed just gone missing. Uh, the other day, I, you know, to give a very specific example, I bought uh, Ghost of Tsushima PS5 game. Uh, I was supposed to get here Saturday. Uh, and I was supposed to get here Friday. It arrived here today. Now, is that a big deal? No, obviously not. But the point is I'm paying for Prime to get, right. you know, at most two days. So this, what am I paying for exactly? This might be the wrong time to raise Prime because, uh, you know, maybe the shipping thing is because of COVID and it's going to get better. Sure. But Or supply chain or whatever excuse you want to use. Sure. But but this is this is now and this is when you're raising it. By the way, Yahoo Finance, uh, actually Bloomberg, pointed out that a lot, that almost half, a little more than half, I'm sorry, 52 percent of uh, Amazon Prime members are monthly members. So they're going to 180 dollars oh, yeah. a year, which really makes you wonder: is it worth uh, the money? I would just advise folks uh, to to really look, you know, g- g- a calculator and see see where your money is going every month because it it may not be worth it, depending, and and it may you know it may not be worth it if you just tweak your things a little. It's like oh well, if if I shop over here or, or if I treat my shopping habits this way, uh, you you know you can you can make this so that it works for you. You don't you don't have to be you know beholden to uh, any any willy nilly price increase. I do encourage folks to like take the time to to look at this stuff because it's important. And, you know, these companies, uh, they don't care, I guess, uh, even though they're making money hand over fist, uh, you know, no one's looking out for you. So that's my rant. 
yeah. with the prime price. And by the way, I am an NFL fan, and I actually would pay Amazon not to do Thursday Night Football. Keep it on, keep it on CBS and ESPN. Amazon. That was a huge they, request. They do a terrible from folks job. <laughs> they do a terrible job. Yeah, they were saying a lot of folks were saying, "Can you just like maybe maybe there needs to be two <laughs> tiers of Prime service? One where it's just the Prime shipping as it used to be back in the day, yes, uh, and then one with like all Prime Plus called with all this other stuff." Okay, great. But a lot of folks are literally just here for the free two-day shipping, uh, and now Prime is like oh, all this value, all this stuff. It's like, well, I don't, I don't use this stuff. Why am I paying for it? it, it people just get frustrated, and like, it's, it's, it's highly understandable. The change goes into effect February 18th. If you're a new subscriber, if you're existing Prime subscriber, renew now. Because if you renew after March 25th, that's when it goes up. So if you can renew now, you'll save. Uh, that twenty dollars. It's not about the twenty dollars. It's really about thinking about well, what am I getting for what is now uh, more than ten dollars a month? You know, uh, that's that's a lot of money. My question: What is, is bundled in there? Oh, that's the other question. Everything. Who the hell knows? It's <laughs> a lot who's of running stuff. Amazon. Who's running Amazon PR? Like <laughs> how? How did anyone inside Amazon allow this to be rolled out as part of the earnings announcement? Yeah. Yeah. And, and oh, we made $141 billion this, uh, this quarter. And oh, by the way, <laughs> they had Amazon profits were $14.3 billion in the quarter. It's a trillion dollar company now. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we want more money <laughs> from you. So tone deaf. And think of all the, think of all the union organizers who are going to say, look at how much, you know, Look at how much money Amazon reported making, and they're raising the price on Prime. And what are they, right. you know, what are they giving you? Amazon's PR is not great. Remember how they fumbled the sidewalk announcement and got everybody to say, "Oh, I don't want that." Um, they, they, maybe they're not the most uh, accomplished uh, in the world. They, they spend all this time fighting with reporters. Like there's, there's actually a team that is devoted to, you know you know, asking for corrections, whether or not a correction is, is merited. And if they, you know, like, and they're not doing their job, they're not doing their job of like presenting a positive image of Amazon or like, is that a, left, is that a hangover from Bezos who was pretty combative? Uh, I remember his ex Mackenzie writing a nasty review of uh, the Amazon uh, book, the everything oh, yeah. store, putting it on, Jeez. putting it on Amazon. I think Bezos is kind of combative. I wonder if Andy Jassy, the new CEO, will maybe tone that down a little bit. It's not a good, It's. I mean, here we are, tech journalists, so obviously we don't like it, but it's not a good look to get in fights with people who buy ink by the barrel, as they say. Um, what do you get? I don't know. What do you get? You get maybe two-day delivery, prime video, which is pretty good. Somebody in the in the chat room, uh, is uh, Captain Jay, is saying, well, you should just drop your Netflix and that'll make up the difference. The problem is not everything's on Amazon Prime. There's stuff on Netflix that you want to see. I mean, uh, in fact, Amazon Prime of all of the streaming services, maybe that's, there's, I don't know, is that one of the, I guess if you like The Expanse, yeah, there's good stuff on there, I guess. That was a big show that people like. They also yeah. do include, you know, to their credit, uh, currently they include uh, free unlimited uh, photo storage. You get uh, that, that was one of the reasons yep. why I was like, okay, maybe I'll I'll go all in on Amazon. Now, do you get uh, your, so uh, just, your music uh, free? No, you still pay for your music with Amazon Prime. Uh, they have, uh, Amazon Music, they have kind of like, Mm, like like a thin tier that is free two, with two Prime. million songs. If, yeah, yeah. If you want the real service with seventy million songs and high five, you, you have to pay for Music Unlimited, which if you have Prime is seven ninety nine a month, which is That's less than it's less than the nine ninety nine for for Apple Music. Uh, Cobuzz, which is a, a smaller service, which is high five. That's like eh, like twelve dollars a month. Uh, so it is, you know, you also get like random magazines, uh, like, you know, the February issue of, I don't know, Business Week or, or like Food Network magazine, which is like, cool. I'm, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that, but it just feels so random. And like, it's just on a w website, like a list of like PDFs. It's the same it's, thing with the, and, uh, with yeah. the books. You get the Kindle Unlimited, but it's like, I don't know what kind of books are on there. Right. You don't get Audible. You don't get Comixology. No, no, no. no. And, and they could have very easily like lowered the price of Amazon Music Prime or, you know, or like rolled out, you know, oh, you're getting this much more, you know, free tiers or like we're boosting, you know, we're boosting what's on Prime Video. Like they didn't package it with any benefit to the consumer. I think this I is... Cancel my Prime. 
<laughs> See, I think this is a test. I think Amazon's curious. They know Maybe. that for some people, this will trigger an ex like uh, like Dan <laughs> or Nicholas, a trigger a reexamination. Yeah, uh, and they're curious. Well, how many people? How price sensitive are people to these subscriptions? How far can we push? The in the Everything Store, or maybe it's his uh, successor to that uh, Amazon Unbound. I think it's in the Everything Store. Um, he talked, which is a great. Both books are great about uh, Amazon. He talks about the d pricing of Amazon Prime, and they had no idea what to charge. They just pulled the number out of thin air. They had no idea what it would cost them. There was actually a significant risk it would be a big money loser that a two-day shipping would end up costing much more. Turned out to not be the case. It was a very it was a huge success. It was probably the most successful membership club since Costco. Um, I'm just so this is a changing of norms, or at least pushing norms in a particular direction to to see, test the boundaries. That's what I think. That's what I think. Now, <clears throat> maybe I'm a cynical uh, guy. I have read. It's Brad Stone, by the way, both both of those books, which are fascinating studies in business uh, and psychology. And a lot of what uh, Je at least Jeff Bezos would do would be like that. Well, let's let's see. what If we change it 20 bucks, let's see what happens. See if Dan so Patterson you, notices. So, Leo, you're saying that they, they sat around in their Seattle headquarters and said, why don't we make this announcement as in as ham-handed a fashion <laughs> as possible and see, see like... See if anybody notices... Yeah, that's why their PR is so defensive. They're like, <laughs> damn it, I gotta sell this. <laughs> uh, how about Prime Day? That's pretty successful, and then that's probably a driver. Maybe that'd be the time to announce this Prime Day instead of uh, during your earnings call. Uh, I'm here on the Prime website on Amazon. I'm going to press Explore My Benefits. Here's a page that probably not many people go to. Free two day, free one day, free same day, free ultra fast grocery, prescription delivery, release date delivery, no rush shipping, Amazon day. That's the one where you pick a day and all of your stuff comes on the same day. Yeah. Which see, I, I guess that eliminates uh, truck emissions. I'm not key by Amazon where you give the driver your, your garage door key and you, they leave your package inside prime video, prime video channels, Amazon music, prime, Discount on Amazon Music Unlimited Prime Gaming. What's that? <laughs> I think you get like free DLC for certain games, which is, you know, I'm oh, a yeah. guy's, my huge free time is gaming, but like yeah. uh, free in-game free in content. content. Luna, though, right? No, something else. No, Luna is separate, yeah. Amazon Photos, which is a good deal. That's free, unlimited, well, not free, but included with membership, unlimited full resolution photo storage. Google charges for that now. Yeah, Amazon Kids Plus. I don't. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but yeah, there's. You know, I, I, it's a lot I of tell stuff. You the, yeah, like the Whole Foods, you know, savings. It's no longer Whole Paycheck uh, if you have Prime. Um, oh, see, see, it's pretty substantial. So all they had to all they had to do was say like, oh, and by the way, we're going to give you twenty dollars off a hundred dollars. Yeah. at Whole Foods. For your first year to to offset the increase, which they could easily. Have done. I think they got that in their back pocket. They're saying, "Let's see what happens," and then and then if Dan Patterson quits, we're going to give you twenty bucks. Let's just see. Let's just see. <laughs> do you do you actually take out your phone and scan your Amazon Prime code when you're at Whole Paycheck? I do. Yeah, do no. you really? Yeah. I can't. I, 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 I guess I should. I, save you a lot I do of money? the Amazon Go thing too. Oh, do you? You probably okay. don't have those up in. No, we don't have up them. The North Bay. No. Yeah. All right. Uh, you also get uh, Prime exclusive shipping benefits on Woot. Amazon and, owns great. so many they things. They own everything. <laughs> they own like fabric.com. They, yeah. you know, Zappos. They they own like a lot Zappos, of random. You get, you get free sites. shipping, free upgraded shipping at Zappos. So I, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe this is like, I'm not going to quit because I, uh, I, I'm, they're going to buy everything eventually and I want to keep my membership. <laughs> There's also the Prime Visa card, which I do have, which, you know, it's 5% cash back and anything bought via Amazon.com. So, so I use that. And if you're not a Prime member, that 
drops to 3%. So I'm further incentivized to shop from Amazon, you which I make your money. I don't especially yeah. mind, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just like, wh where's my money going here? <laughs> I, I don't, you know. Uh, and, it, and if you had to, if you had to put it all together yourself, I think uh, that might be hard to, hard to do. So, all right. I'm trying to, gin, I was trying to gin up consumer outrage and instead we've just said, you know, it's a pretty good deal. Actually. I think I'll stay. I think I'll keep it. I think I'm I'll pretty sure it. the, the journal wrote a story is prime still worth it the other day. It's just got a lot of, a lot of people are talking and again, it's, it's a fairly small price, $2 a month, not that big, but a lot of people are like, huh, I By don't the way, know. what is, what's going on here? The journal's conclusion. Here's why it's still worth it. <laughs> There you go. We're all in the tank. <laughs> We're all in the like, tank for Jeff and company. Us. Yeah. By the way, the uh, the mayor of the Dutch city says, We're not taking apart the bridge. Don't worry. You saw that story. Jeff Bezos' new yeah. yacht. Again, not, not a good look, Jeff. <laughs> While you're raising prime costs, Jeff Bezos' new yacht is so big uh, that the shipyard where they make it uh said you got to dismantle the bridge um i like jalopnik's headline on this here's the boat that won't bring jeff bezos's hair or his wife back feel the second hand shame <laughs> <laughs> 540 million mega yacht so big it's built by a company uh, in uh, holland called oceano that it can't fit through the bridge Although again, I saw uh, I have to I have to find that article, but I I saw the article that said the mayor said no 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 because he was getting a lot of pushback. We're not going <laughs> to not going to dismantle the historic bridge just for that yacht. Uh, all right, you guys are so quiet. I'm I was expecting more more feistiness over Prime. Let me see if I can find something that'll upset you. Something that'll get you mad. How about, uh, I've been saving this, but I guess it's time to, to play the Rogan card. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's interesting. Um, John Stewart said, knock it off, everybody. John Stewart, leftist uh, journalist, uh, the Daily Show host. He's now got a show on uh, Apple. Maybe it's because he's on Apple now. He can't be so. He says, people should not, call for Joe to be uh, censured or, or canceled. I actually, believe it or not, I kind of agree. I don't want to see censorship. Uh, but boy, the hate fest continues. There's now a, a super cut of Joe Rogan using the N-word. Pretty old stuff. There's a, there's a video of him laughing hysterically while a fellow comic talks about sexual abuse. Uh, it feels like the guns are, and knives are out for Joe Rogan. Anyone in, okay. uh, have an opinion on that, Dan? You're a journalist. Should Spot what should Spotify do about Joe Rogan? They are going to post a disclaimer, apparently. Well, definitely, journalists shouldn't advise on policy. However, um, and I, I mean, nobody wants to be accused or engaged in censorship. Um, but I, I think it's fair that if you say offensive things like the N word repeatedly, or you have people who are pretty close to racists and Nazi sympathizers like the people he's had on, uh, especially in the early days. Uh, I think if you have people like Sargon of Akkad who have said horrible things about women, I think if you advance um, a, a ton of mis and disinformation about uh, COVID and vaccines, then it's okay for people to say that is offensive. And if you take $100 million, that means that Spotify owns you. You work for them. They're not a platform like Facebook. And it's not analogous to Twitter or QAnon that we find offensive and maybe we want to get. It's not the same. He works for them. And it's fair for an employer to say, hey, we don't like you saying the N-word. We're taking the content down. Spotify. The culture war stuff, the the whole censorship argument, I have no idea. I have no yeah. idea. Nobody wants to engage in censorship. I happen to think that maybe that's a little bit of a red herring, and it's a distracting argument. It 
it does not talk about the victims. What about people who don't like hearing the N word because it's a really offensive term? Uh, what about the the fact that misinformation at scale about vaccines is harmful? I, I mean, it, talking about Joe Rogan, I think focuses a conversation on Joe Rogan, and that's great. It's great for his attention, but it doesn't talk about the victims. And I I don't. I don't ever want to be in a position where like censorship is bad. Yeah, sure. It's bad. But you know what? He's done some things that many people have been hurt by. And you know what? Let's maybe talk about those people and the fact that Spotify paid him a hundred million dollars to do that. Yeah. Also censorship is done by governments. Yeah. Spotify is not too. a government. No, there is an so employer. And, they're not, and, they're not, by the way, they're not, uh, he says, they say, we don't own him. We are not his employer. We gave him a hundred million dollars so that he would be exclusive on our platform, but we do not own. What's the, the difference? Well, we don't own the show. We don't employ him. Uh, and somebody last week made the point, a good point. Uh, you, you get, you knock Joe off Spotify. You actually, more people will hear him if he goes back to YouTube and plain old podcasting. Right now, as a okay. Spotify exclusive, you have to listen through Spotify. I, uh, I think one one big mental fix for thinking about these is to stop using the word platform. Like, do not allow it. Facebook is not a platform. It's a social network. Spotify yeah. is an internet broadcaster. Airbnb is a lodging marketplace. Uber is a ride-hailing service. Once you start calling things what they actually are, it really clarifies policy That's decisions. A darn good point, you know, it, it clarifies, um, you know, like how we should view, uh, you know, actions. Like, you know, we view we view CBS as, you know, just to pick on Dan's employer, uh, as responsible for what is broadcast on CBS. Like, yeah, if Dan started so, spouting yeah. this, they'd fire him. It's, look, you asked me my opinion at the very onset of the show. You asked me my opinions and I about a, a topic I don't even remember now. But I squirmed a little bit because I had to. Like, I You're not used to be giving opinions. an opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not my job to yeah. express opinions. Yeah. Though. It's not my job. That's so I, old fashioned. It, I love it. <laughs> well, I mean, look, it really isn't. It's. I don't even think that that's old fashioned. I think that that harms the trust relationship I, agree, I have with uh, audiences. Uh, I agree 100%. I, I don't do mean old fashioned in a bad way. Right. It's a good thing. It's just I just not... can't do my job. People can't trust me. And guess what? People don't trust Joe Rogan either. And now they don't trust Spotify. Right. It's you know, And it's, it's fair. It's been it's a surprising fair. pushback. I thought, you know, when Neil Young said, well, I'm on my music off... Spotify's reaction was probably like mine, like, well, fine, Neil, go ahead. <laughs> Big deal. But actually, it's hurt them quite a bit. And with the other artists, Nils Lofgren and Joni Mitchell and uh, podcasters uh, saying, yeah, we don't want to be on this platform. It actually seems to have hurt them. There seems to be a movement to cancel Spotify uh, memberships. I the funny know. thing is a, a lot of musicians... Uh, came forward saying, oh, yeah, we're going to take our stuff off of Spotify, too. And then they discovered, or someone reminded them, they sold off their publishing rights. Whoops. <laughs> it's not up to you, some private buddy. equity firm. <laughs> Talk to <ASCAP>. and, Yeah. <laughs> it's not up to you. Yeah. I guess I would say I have a, a pretty, I don't know, I think a, a pretty interesting take on this. I've been, I've been listening to Rogan basically since day one. Uh, I used to listen to Howard Stern and Opie and Anthony as a young man. And Rogan was always on the time on the Opie and Anthony show. This is like 2005, six, seven. So this is a very long time ago. Back in the day, he used to talk a lot about like, like ancient aliens and like exoplanets and like, <laughs> was he, uh, like can I ask you? Cause I, I am yeah. not, I am, I've never listened to the podcast. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with him, but was he ever a stand up? They call him a comedian. Yes. So he did yes. do stand up. Yeah, he's got a bunch of specials. Yeah, he's a stand up comedian. Okay. Uh, so and, you know, stand ups know say from... all sorts of nutty things. And sure. It's, and it's understood yeah. it's comedy. I mean, you yeah. could still get and, and canceled people, as a stand up, you know, God knows, but. but there's a certain it's understanding the that you, you push the limits. Stern pushed the we, limits. It's funny to see the Rogan debate pop up because I was actually part of a podcast a couple of years ago uh, where we analyzed it. It was called the Joe Rogan Experience Experience. We had like four <laughs> episodes. Uh, the problem was that man produces such a volume of content that up. it was impossible <laughs> to, to listen and to like take notes on that stuff. So if anyone's been like listening closely to what this man has been saying for the length of his career, it's, it's kind of been me. Uh, and, I, and I just wanted to add, you know, as finally uh, you we've know. got a Joe Rogan expert on the show. <laughs> 
Finally. I'm also look. I've also been uh, racially abused in my life, uh, and it's not fun. Uh, it, yeah. yeah, I can think of. There, there is one particular instance where I felt very. I'm obviously not going to get into it, uh, but to have your personhood diminished because of the color of your skin is not fun. Uh, having said that, uh, as that person, uh, I listened to his. You know, obviously, you, you really can't defend the viral video that came out this weekend. That's indefensible. But like, just some like spicy humor is like. I don't know. It, it's never bothered me. I is is that is that my family background? Is, I've been around this kind of content. You know, frankly, my family is a, a very blue collar family. A lot of law enforcement. Uh, it is not exactly as a waspy family that is offended by like words and stuff. Uh, so that I, I I don't know if like uh, you know the elite media has a very similar background. Uh, but yeah, it it is it is it is very interesting to see. Like you said, the knives come out. Uh, I personally, as someone who has listened, I don't listen as much anymore uh, just because I can't stand the COVID talk. I'm over this. Uh, I Does he talk wish about he COVID a lot to, now? Like, uh, it's exhaust. It's I. It, it's it's like it's 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 too much. It's it's like if you're hosting like a radio show, it's like can we get onto another topic? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I do wish he would go back to like you know like the aliens and like you know he had uh, UFC fighters on like like I I like that stuff. Uh, I don't. The, the focus of the show really seems to have fallen off. Uh, fallen off with the move. And, and it was great that you guys had the Spotify debate last week because I was like, you know, if I'm Spotify, is this even worth the trouble anymore? Like have people join Spotify, Spotify premium because Rogan is there, uh, you know, they'll show growth, right? But would that growth have occurred anyway? Is he that big of a draw that it is worth the constant and unrelent, the relentless like news cycle, like focus on this man? I don't know that it is. Ultimately, I think this is gotten, probably good for him, right? Pe more people know about him and probably more people are And listening. the idea, and I also think it's kind of funny, The let, let's say Spotify's, you know, this is actually not worth our trouble. We're not, we're, goodbye, Rogan. There's some clause in the contract where they, they sever the relationship. Uh, are people going to, like who, his mega fans, are they going to all of a sudden start reading like the Atlantic <laughs> or are they going to like, that's not happening. No. <laughs> so like, I don't, I kind of don't understand, you know, I, I don't think you should be saying fake things about the vaccine. Like, obviously I'm not a fool, but like the idea that the people listening to this are all of a sudden going to be, going to be listening to, to Edward R. Murrow or whatever is like, that seems fanciful and fake. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and I kind of think that maybe that bothers folks that this, this, this meathead who, who is a commentator on MMA has such a reach and influence. Maybe that bothers people. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of, that's sort of my take. I, 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 as, as, as a one time fan of this guy, I wish he would kind of get away from this stuff because it's exhausting and it is not fun. Uh, it's just not a fun, you know, let's, let's get back to ancient civilizations uh, and that type of thing. Cause that, that was as a young man, that, that was interesting talk. Uh, and he doesn't, do that as much anymore. I, you know, I listen to Stern too, and sometimes it's offensive. Sometimes it's like, I can't believe you're talking about this, uh, but you can turn it off. And um, I guess the big issue is if he's giving advice to people who believe it about health, which where he has no expertise or he's having pseudo experts on, uh, uh, and people are listening to it and not getting and actually risking their lives because of it. Is what then? Then what do you do? Because I'm not. I'm not for shutting people's voices down. I, I, I think we just have to rely. Yeah, I, on I think he acknowledged in one of his. He's done a couple apology videos in the past week or so. I think in one of them he said, like, "Yeah, maybe we should step away from this. Maybe I should have. I should be better informed." I think he know. It's kind of you know, obviously. I don't know him. Uh, I was a fan from way back. It feels like the show has gotten out of control. It has gotten so big that maybe like the power has gone. This was a show again. This was a show he was live streaming from like his basement right. or whatever, talking Success about like Cahokia. Yeah, yeah, and it's like he's so big and it's so powerful. You got that rush of like you know people wanting to deplatform him. He's his fans him on uh when you know, everything has to was, everything has to become that doesn't it these days well it's, i think that's the challenge yeah. here i uh, i i don't like the the polarized uh conversation i don't think anybody does but i, I think it's fair to like i listened to rogan for a long time too uh in 2017 and 2018 i heard really offensive stuff about women and about people of color. And I, I stopped listening because I, I heard a lot of offensive stuff. I don't, 
I don't recall thinking this guy should be canceled. What I did is dial out. And I think that there is a nuanced conversation that can be had here. I agree that maybe nobody is going to stop listening to Joe Rogan and start reading The Atlantic. But I think that it is fair to say I find this offensive and I find that the 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 profit from that to also be offensive. Uh, and that's that's fair and fine to say. I don't think that dismissing that is helpful. Yeah. Well, and just to uh, give you some uh, ammunition here, uh, according to The Verge, who talked to an ad buyer who wished to be anonymous, it's a million dollars an ad to get an ad on the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, it is absolutely a money maker. I, I, uh, that money does go to Joe, of course, but uh, Spotify sells the ads, so they're, it's part of the Spotify ad network. So it is very good for Spotify's business. Whether they'll make $100 million in a year or two, I don't know, but uh, there's no question it's added to their subscriber base and they make good money on the advertisements. Yeah, and it's it's also and, to me it's like there's sorry there's clearly a demand for for this talk. It's like I, it feels like one of the, like the unspoken oh this he's so popular. Let's you know Spotify doesn't release a lot of people numbers, are but Joe says 11 million listeners yeah, per episode. That's I, like I don't that's, know if I credit that, but that's a lot. That's a huge number of people who are listening yeah. to this guy who are not uh, consuming other forms of media. Right. And I think it's like, why, why are people attracted to this? Is it, I don't know. Those are, those are like interesting media questions. Don't, com uh, don't comics yeah. often ask this though. Isn't this kind of a common discussion among comics? What is my responsibility? As you become huge, do I change my act? Do I change my stick or do I stick with what I'm doing? Uh, what's my responsibility now that I have a large audience? I think you don't have to be a comic to ask those questions. I came from radio. I remember yeah. Stern. I'm yeah. a journalist. I ask myself those questions all the time. You can be a normal person and ask yourself, what's my responsibility to the culture and society in which I live, yeah. especially if I'm profiting from something? I don't think this has... I Look, I, I agree with a lot of what we're talking about here, but I don't like the... Uh, let's wrap this in comedy. Let's wrap this in I'm just an entertainer. Those all seem like easy excuses for not taking responsibility. And... I, I mean, do and say what you want. That's fine. But you you don't get an out just because you're a comedian. I don't get an out for being a journalist. No. And you get you an still out have some for being responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And he does, let's face it, he sells uh, vitamins and stuff. I mean, he has maybe some uh, incentive to say, well, you just need these immune uh, pills instead of a COVID vaccine, which would be reprehensible if he's profiting from misinformation. Um, there are those who say, in fact, there's an Atlantic article from a couple of years ago that Joe Rogan is so popular because he understands men in America better than most people do. And we should be paying attention. Uh, it, it's no surprise. It's two young guys who listen to Rogan a lot. Um, did he speak? I certainly did a lot when I was, when I was young. I'm did he speak now, to you but... as a young guy, as a young man? It was like, he's. I mean, more, more than like, you know, barons or so, something like right. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nicholas, I found the same content. I, I, I mean, I think a lot of people use the YouTube discovery and engine when I would be editing a story or something. It was fairly, I could listen to something else. Definitely. I wanted to hear about spaceships and I wanted to hear maybe a, a talk with the guy from tool. And I wanted to hear Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson. It's when you yeah. bundle that in with the, the Sargon of Akkad's or the, the, yeah. um, you know, he had, um, some, maybe I shouldn't name names, but he had some people who have fairly reprehensible beliefs on and he platformed them. He amplified them. And yeah. I, I think that there's a responsibility there. I'm not saying, oh, let's cancel pitchforks, but I, I'm saying yeah. that maybe there should be a responsibility and wrapping it in comedy seems like an easy out. Yeah. Sure. But as, for, as a listener, yeah, but no, no, no. as a listener, I, I don't know who Sar got like, if I like, I, if I'm listening to this, it's like I'm not into it. I, I'm going to turn it off. If he, if he's if he's interviewing, you know, Michael Bisping of the UFC, I'm probably going to listen to that. Uh, like you said earlier, it's like if I'm into it, I could I could tune out of it. You know, if there's if there's a controversial comedian coming to the luck to the local, you know, chuckle hut, uh, I don't have to go. Uh, his fans will go. Whether does everybody like the that comedian? Probably not. But if the man has fans and they go and they pay and they, they I don't necessarily have like an ideological problem with that. I guess. And for advertisers, you know, they, they might object to some of the content, but they're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, 
these are these are people who are probably not going to watch CNN. Exactly. Probably not going to listen to. It's a to valuable NPR. audience. Yeah. They are hard to reach. Yeah. Um, and Spotify sells you know packages of ads where like if you want to buy Joe Rogan you have to buy other ads mm -hmm. on the Spotify network. So mm -hmm. it's it's more than just the hundred million, more than just the two fifty million. Yeah. You know. All right. Let's take a little break. I'm sorry to bring up the Joe Rogan thing. I just wanted to get. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just want to buddy. piss sorry. people off. You're, you're not, sorry. You're not <laughs> sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Not at all. Uh, our show today brought to you by Podium. You know, text messaging is the best way to talk to your customers. That's how they want to hear from you. They don't want you to call them. They don't. Who wants junk mail? Who wants email? We want text messages. If you own a business, there just aren't enough hours in a day to waste playing phone tag. The list of customers you need to reach doesn't get any shorter, especially when business is good. That's why local businesses everywhere turn to Podium. 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 P-O-D-I-U-M. Makes every interaction as easy as sending a text. So everything that makes your business great can get done faster. I'm noticing more and more businesses around me are using Podium. My dentist, when I leave, says, leave a review. Or they, and no, I love it. They send me uh, my appointment. So I just... Click it, and it's added to my calendar. Uh, you can collect payments with Podium. You can market to your customers. The ice cream store in town <laughs> sends me a coupon. It's the worst thing ever. Every few weeks, we miss you. Here's a coupon for 30% off ice cream. No! <laughs> Podium does it. It works. They make it all as easy as pressing send, and you won't just free up more time. You'll grow your business. You'll get more done. With Podium, you'll close deals with customers before the competition even has a chance to call them back. Yeah, a lot of times uh, that's how you can uh, get a job, issue a quote. People text you, you text them back. Podium makes it easy with a single inbox. Your employees will like it. Your customers will love it. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free. Podium.com slash twit. Or sign up for a paid Podium account and you'll get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. That's Podium, P-O-D-I-U-M dot com slash twit. Thank you, Podium, for your support of this week in tech. Podium dot com slash twit. What do you think? Is, is, the, uh, is the pandemic uh, coming to a close? Are we, uh, are we open? I feel like it's all over. It's over. Go home. Go, come, go out of your home. Go to work. Stop! Stop working at home, Dan. Do you do you feel that? Do you feel that sudden like you know? I'm watching a football game and there's a hundred thousand people without masks just sitting cheering and everything. Huh. No, I don't know. I'm in I'm in New York and uh, it definitely doesn't feel like it, it's no. over. But you guys are um, uh, you guys are shell shocked. You got PTSD. I mean, you've had two yeah, big I surges. Mean, there were maybe fewer people. Omicron was, was felt December and early January felt a lot like March, 2020. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, we're, I was supposed to go to the office tomorrow, but we're just going to do a remote hit. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think we were supposed to be back in the office in January and then it's, so who knows? I, I don't, I don't think that this doesn't feel over to me, but, uh, I'm near. I'm. 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 Uh, I'm in Hudson Valley, so let's call it two hours north of New York City. And I, it's not over up here. But uh, I was visiting visiting a friend in the city the other day. Uh, it is over ish up here. Uh, you know, masks. People wearing masks. And so our uh, county executive said he was not going to enforce the New York State mask uh, requirement. So it's kind of kind of weird. Uh, but it feels like it's it's maybe winding down a little bit. I'll, I'll give some slight insight. CR, uh, we have been working from home since March of 2020. I have not been back to the office in Yonkers since March of 2020. I may actually go back uh, in a month or two. We're testing. Do you miss uh, it? Game, Do you want to go game. back? No. Do I yeah, miss the office? Nobody wants to go back. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice office too. It was. It's the nicest office I've ever worked in, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I've had the most productive years in my life as a worker bee working for any organization uh, over the past two years. Uh, so I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, so who's not, who knows? I mean, there's going to be a lot of news because we're going to hit a million deaths, you know, that's for sure. And there's going to be a lot of news about that. Um, but as it starts, I don't know. What do you think? Am I, uh, I feel, I just feel a lightning. And at the same time, 
I notice I'm I don't I'm not uncomfortable wearing a mask, so I might still wear a mask all the time. I don't know. What what, what do you think, Owen? Uh, you know, San Francisco has been kind of um, you know we we've been pretty far out there in terms of um, ma you know masking like. The Bay Area, as you know, was one of the first areas to shelter in place voluntarily before the state went, to, you know, went right. to shelter in place. Um, so it feels like overall we've we've handled it really well. You know, the the continued weird thing is that, um, you know, speaking here from downtown, uh, ironically, in an office, is that many employers are, you know, have gone remote first or they've postponed yet again a return to office. Um I think so, that might be one of the one of the reasons it's not over is is we've kind of normalized this way of life and we like it and I don't I I think uh, you know people are traveling like crazy the TSA numbers are really back to normal uh, people are flying they're traveling they're going places but I think a lot of people don't want to go back to the office and so that may not happen I don't know I mean even for certain jobs like my job I'm basically in Google Docs and on the phone or on Zoom all day. That that yeah. is basically so You don't my need to be in the job. office. I could, yeah. I could do that from Jupiter. It doesn't yeah. necessarily matter. Yeah. You know, a decade ago or more than a decade ago when I was at TechCrunch, I was also working from home. You know, TechCrunch had offices uh, in San Francisco and New York at the time and I would go into the New York office every now and then, uh, but I would work from home and it was not I, I was I didn't you know I wasn't building Toyotas I was writing articles in Google Docs and talking on the phone to people so it's right. like does does my job if I'm a business owner do I do I need an office with X many seats if I could just have the folks work from home why am I going to pay for that office space uh, so I guess we'll see I agree I, I think that one of the bigger things coming out of the pandemic will be people's relationship to their jobs and 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 what is my labor good for and do I need to be in any specific place to do this. Uh, you know, obviously if, if you have, you know, my, my brother is a forklift driver in a warehouse. He cannot do that remotely. Uh, he's been going to the, to, to, to the office this whole time. Uh, I'm different. So it, it does sort of depend on, how, on what you're doing. How does he feel about, uh, the pandemic and, and so forth? How, how is he's had to work? He's, uh, he's had to work. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm reluctant to give his true opinion. It's, it's a slightly spicy opinion. I think he would say something along the lines of, uh, you know, people who are so lucky to work from home uh, don't like don't talk to me type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I don't attitude. blame him at all for that. I mean, think, yeah, yeah. There's so many people who are who had to go to work regardless. Yeah, he's you know? he's a little younger. He's he's 26, uh, and so he, you know he'll see articles online where like oh. Going back to the office, should we, should we? And he just shakes his head uh, in so many words and he's like, whatever, bro, uh, whatever. Uh, he's, he doesn't have a lot of time for, or a lot of sympathy for people in my position, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't blame him. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm recording a podcast from our office because it's just more convenient. You know, I don't have to worry about someone ringing the doorbell. Uh, you know, we live in a relatively small San Francisco apartment. Um have but, you been to you know, a movie theater? No, and you know one of our one of our favorite theaters, you know, one where my husband and I saw so many movies, um, just closed yeah. on Thursday. The Embarcadero Center. Oh, um, that's sad. Yeah, great, great little movie theater. Closed forever. Um, closed uh, as far as we know forever. Wow. Uh, I, I, possible someone might reopen it as a as a theater, but. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, and it, it, it's hard for that category of like art house theater. Is that something you really want to leave your house and, you know, go into a crowd of people for? I mean, I, I think we'll be dealing with like the, the psychological reverberation, you know, reverberations of this for. I'm telling you. Um, for years. PTSD. We're going to be the, the, the COVID yeah. generation, generation C. Uh, because, yeah, we're like the depression uh survivors who didn't want to spend a dime you know we all know them our elders uh we're gonna be you know our grandkids say why does grandpa wear a mask everywhere it's very interesting i haven't been to a movie theater since it started or a concert oh no i have been to concerts actually that's uh, interesting i i it's neither here nor there i just when we were talking about joe rogan i thought well i wonder what everybody thinks as we, I feel like the light at the end of the tunnel, is that reasonable? And it could be an oncoming, uh, 
Yeah, I think if you look a lot of the a lot of European countries are are winding down restrictions. Uh, so that fi- there's that trucker thing in Canada, the guys demand it like that. Uh, it feels like it is beginning. Yeah, I, I think light at the end of the tunnel uh, feels okay. Uh, but then who knows? My my my, knows? my adopted mother is like uh, has, a, has a PhD in biology, and she's like, you have no idea. Like a, a snap of a finger, there could be another variant that's like there could a be. big one or whatever. There could be. Yeah, we might. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we have absolutely. No, we don't know. And I think to your point of the the psychological, it's the uncertainty and the constant yo-yoing back and forth. Oh, it's over. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's that's just We're done. even for me. I've been We're lucky enough to be working from home. It's yeah. it is a real blow psychologically. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're done. With I, that. I, can someone explain to me the trucker protest? Because aren't truckers <laughs> like alone in the cab? How are they affected? Uh, did you see that uh, they they raised? It turned out it really was out of the U.S. And uh, and a lot of the money raised in GoFundMe's uh, was uh, really political fundraising. In effect, GoFundMe is actually frozen almost ten million dollars. Um, saying you know, uh, this is Fox News even says <laughs> promoted Capitol Hill occupied protest appeal. I don't know what that means, but. Uh, Dan, are you doing any reporting on the uh, on the Canadian trucker protest? None. 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 Uh, a lot of Trump flags in the group. I don't. I don't think they can vote for Trump in Canada. I might be wrong. The other thing I was going to add is that the I, I was, I'm not obviously not doing any reporting on a Canadian trucker protest, but uh, the <laughs> GoFundMe shutdown reminded me of I'm sure you remember Leo and Owen too. Uh, I probably you too. Uh, WikiLeaks way back in the day, uh, I guess it was like 2010 uh, when when like PayPal and Visa shut them down, uh, and th- then they started asking for donations in Bitcoin, uh, and it's just the idea of of you know not not casting any sort of judgment on this protest, but the, the idea of like. Uh, a fundraising uh, scheme being shut down by a centralized authority was like one of the great like selling points of crypto back in the day. Say, like, ah, oh, this this routes around that damage. You don't even have to deal with centralized authorities anymore. So that that's that's really what this thing reminded me of more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know much. It's interesting how little we know. If you lived in Ottawa, you would know. You would care. It'd be a big deal for you. There's, you know, the Freedom Convoy is overwhelming Ottawa apparently but uh, I think it's mostly American truckers which is one reason probably Canadians aren't real thrilled by the whole thing um, how about how about this article from a guy named Owen Thomas Sil- in protocol Silicon Valley loves mafias and you should too what's that what's that what's what's your premise here Mr. Thomas so there was this uh, this guy named Ryan Breslow who co-founded a uh, a payment startup called Bolt, and he went on Twitter to say that uh, Stripe, you know, which is kind of the you know the big you know up and coming player in payment processing, and Y Combinator, which is a startup accelerator that helped Stripe get its start, were acting like mob bosses, and you know that that they had actively you know tried to tried to prevent his business from getting off the ground. You could um, not attack two more beloved entities in Silicon Valley than Stripe know, and Y Combinator. I mean, if anybody the if anybody's beloved in Silicon Valley, it's these two companies. Y Combinator know, Stripe, is a yeah. uh, I should mention is a uh, kind of a, a a startup camp where you can go, you get a little bit of an investment, you get a lot of education, a lot of learning, a lot of companies have come out of Y Combinator. Uh, and of course, uh, as you mentioned, Stripe is the is the leader in payments processing. Um, Airbnb, Dropbox, you know, a yeah, lot of a lot of big, you've, heard, you've yeah, heard of got yeah. their got their start here. And Stripe is you know Stripe is well regarded because they made tools that are really easy for developers to integrate into you know their, their I websites should, at and this software their junction apps. mention that we use Stripe and we are they are a sponsor. So okay, go ahead. <laughs> Full disclosure. Full disclosure. Uh, so it doesn't affect how I, how we cover it, obviously, but uh, yeah. So I, I thought it was interesting. Bressla was was, you know, playing on this idea that there are these like networks in Silicon Valley. They're often called 
mafias. That's probably why you use the term mob bosses. You know, the PayPal mafia. But there's also a Facebook mafia, which oh, yeah. just means yeah. a bunch of alumni from Facebook who went and started companies after they left Facebook. And this is there's history. A, you point out that that's how uh, Intel was started, or actually Fairchild was started. Yeah, it's. I mean, the, you know, the whole history of Silicon Valley is groups of employees meeting at one company and leaving to yeah. start another. Yeah. Um, now, you know, Breslow is, is saying, well, this, you know, the system got kind of broken because like he wanted to, you know, he wanted to bust in and start his company. Well, Bolt started three years after Stripe. So, you know, his complaint is that Stripe had lined up all of the, you know, all of the great startup investors. Well, it's considered really bad form if you're a venture capitalist to invest in a direct competitor. Yeah. So they don't generally do that. So I didn't really get what his complaint was there. And then he also had like, um, you know, th these other theories that um, that Hacker News, which is this website that Y Combinator operates, it's you know Reddit like you know upvoting and downvoting links. I live that, on Hacker News. I love oh, yeah, Hacker they, News. Yeah. You know, so he claimed that um, when Bolt had some announcement that his, you know, his announcement got downvoted and Stripe had a similar announcement that got upvoted. And the editor of Hacker News, um, you know, or moderator went on to explain, well, Bolt's post was very, you know, commercial and kind of, you know, yeah. advertisement-like and people tend to stuff. downvote that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this guy sounds, I would have just said, oh, he's just a whiny loser, except for the fact that he's worth 11, the company's worth $11 billion, actually about to raise for $14 billion. I know. It's like if, you know, so if Stripe and Y Combinator are mob bosses, they are the most inept mafiosi <laughs> not, not you've ever met. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I did think it was an interesting, you know, an interesting discussion to be had about like these networks of people that kind of make Silicon Valley run. And, you know, are they always to the good? Something I didn't get into in the piece is that there is a problem with mafias, which is that, you know, uh, they tend to perpetuate a lack of diversity. Like if you have a group of mostly young white men at, say, PayPal, and they go and start companies, they have a tendency to pull that same not very diverse network with them. Now, it happens that, you know, at PayPal, there were actually a lot of women, too, um, who went and started companies, played key roles, uh, became investors. For some reason, they get ridden out of the the history of the PayPal mafia. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But you know, I think there there are, there are, are critiques to be made of mafias, of alumni networks, of these connections. Uh, but Breslau did not make them. It's a story as old as time. By the way, Breslau stepped down as CEO after this. Uh, so the story that's old as time is one: people getting in trouble on Twitter. Yeah, it's never ever a good thing to get get spicy on Twitter, but but two, that's how it's always worked. When I, when I was in college, I went to a, a prestige university because that's where you make the connections. And the people who really wanted to be prestigious would join the secret society where you'd really make the connections. It's but that's a hundred years old. It's probably as old as humanity. And in fact, for a long time, was the the kind of the sung as the praises of San Francisco and Silicon Valley is well, you know, that's where you're going to have these serendipitous interactions with other people who are working, and you'll share information, and that's the value of it. Um, I'd be hard to stop that. Yes, diversity would be nice. Um, so maybe work on that. But then they. Could but that's be not part of the. That's old, not the critique he made. You know, know he yeah. wanted to be part of. Of this, you know, yeah. old boys. I wanted now. to join, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> and you know, and and again, like his company's been very successful. Um, you know, it's just it felt a little sour grapes. And um, you know, on the other hand, we're all talking about Bolt now. Yeah, it was a good marketing. It wasn't even, you know, it wasn't yeah. even on the radar before. You know, it's so good. Maybe he won. You know, it's good marketing is to please your girlfriend by writing a word game. And then selling it for seven figures to the New York Times. That's good marketing. I'm talking, of course, about Wordle. Um, I had to laugh, though. Uh, Anderson Cooper wants to do it. He's a big Wordle fan, wants to do a story of Wordle. Does he invite Patrick Wardle, the creator of Wordle, onto CNN? No, he invites Monica Lewinsky on. 
<laughs> to talk about how much she likes Wordle. And I thought, that's what's wrong. That's why I'm only going to watch cbsnews.com slash live from now on. Because <laughs> you guys would never, ever do that. Um, do you play Wordle, anybody? John, you playing it? All right. None of these guys play Wordle. It, are you actively My avoiding it? Have you never heard of it? Or I'm, bad uh, I'm actively it. avoiding it. Yeah. I saw people on Twitter talking about it and like... This Jeff is one of my Jarvis like, red lines for me. I'm like, it. I'm not. He hates it. He <laughs> says all the people sharing their wordle on there has ruined. I'm Twitter. happy for them. Yeah. I hope they have a great day. Yeah. But I'm it's, not. I'm it's not. stopped. By the way, it seems to have stopped. It doesn't. <laughs> doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> I think Monica Lewinsky, by the way, has has had like this incredible second act. Um, Renaissance. You know, I, yeah, I mean. Um, you know, and, and good on her for like not letting what a man did to her to find. Oh, no, it's great. Find who she is. It's great. Uh, it's just this is kind of unfortunately the celebrity uh, mindset of, I guess, of CNN. I would invite the programmer on to talk about it. But well, Jeff uh, Zucker isn't there to make those. No, no, there. no. He's gone. <laughs> and apparently Lewinsky uh, is writing for The Atlantic and wrote a story about Wordle in The Atlantic. So that's the. Uh, See, there's that's a real exactly. natural tie in there. <laughs> but I think that I, I think that the fact that the New York Times, um, you know, splashed out. Uh, I understand, like, what low seven figures? They said seven the figures. I've got to figure it's low, which that's means true. a million bucks. But still, good on Patrick, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that also tells you how you know, like, how important games are to the New York Times yeah. strategy. And we're talking word games, crosswords, of course, as, you know, being kind of the iconic offering from the New York Times. But, um, it, you know, it just goes to show you that, you know, just like pumping more URLs out into the internet is not necessarily the answer to, um, you know, to internet media's problems. By the way, I want to correct myself. And if if Anderson Cooper had invited Patrick Wardle on, he would have gotten the wrong guy. It's Josh Wardle. Patrick Wardle is also a programmer, well known from uh, Mac, the Mac world. Josh Wardle, who invented uh, Wordle, he's a, a nice Welsh guy who invented it for his uh, girlfriend during lockdown, and uh, and is now making some some, some well low seven figure money <laughs> for it, which is good. And it's smart. It's very smart of the New York Times to scoop that up, right? Because uh, you, you, they have word games already and you, you want that word of mouth. You want that uh, attention, don't you? Speaking of bundled subscriptions, that is yeah, the future of the sure. Times, right? Times has done very well with that. Very smart. Very well. I, get, you know, I pay for uh, cooking, crosswords. In fact, my biggest problem with the New York Times, I can't get them to stop sending, delivering the newspaper. I don't want the newspaper. <laughs> I just want the other stuff. And I can't figure out, maybe somebody could tell me, how do you subscribe to the digital only version of the New York Times? I, you know, I've, I've narrowed it down to just the Sunday Times, but I, I don't want it. I can read it online two or three days ahead of time. Uh, the Times also just recently bought uh, The Athletic, that uh, sports website, which which is am amazing if you're into like sports writing, like in-depth report. It's, it's, it's really I, I good. The they best. deserve that. I've actually. subscribed Brady's yeah. Basley since day one. Yeah. Uh, they yeah, deserve awesome. that. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Uh, let's talk about Apple. They uh, have responded to Dutch regulators who said, you've got to allow... For some reason, Dutch dating apps to have their own in-app purchases. This is one of many places like South Korea and perhaps soon the U.S. where Apple is being uh, forced to give up their, uh, their app store, their 30% VIG. So the, Apple's response was, okay, okay, we'll, we'll give you your own app store and uh, you'll only owe us 27% commission because we're not doing the payments processing anymore and the response from the community is amazing Stephen uh, Trotton Smith who's an Apple developer uh, absolute, this is on Twitter absolutely vile his response he says this says everything about Tim Cook's Apple and what it thinks of developers I hope the company gets exactly what it deserves everybody on the executive team should be ashamed and some of them should not be here when it's all over 
We all see you. Uh, Marco Arment, who, of course, is a, a well-known developer and uh, for for uh, iOS. His uh, Overcast is, is a very yeah. popular uh, podcast player. He also worked at Tumblr. He wrote, you can just feel how much Apple despises having to do any of this. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if you're a developer, they've made it so there's absolutely no way you're going to do this because once you pay the 3% to your credit card company and you still pay Apple 27% and there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through, you have to have a dedicated app just for it, special app. There's You have to do all sorts of paperwork. Um, it's just, I think it's fascinating that Apple is willing just to, to go balls to the wall, excuse me, mm -hmm. testicles to the wall for this. <laughs> like, dudes, you don't read the room. This is not what people are, are talking about here. I, you know, I think, it, I think what it says is that the App Store Commission is only marginally about payments. It's about yeah, that's exactly marketing. Right. Ah. It's about marketing. It's about distribution. It's about you know, discoverability in the app store. It's about the, you know, you know, the SDK, all the tools that you get as a developer to build your app. So you're defending and Apple. You think Apple's right. Abs absolutely. I mean, you know, like, look, it's, it's capitalism. Like this is, this is the cost of doing business. We created and this beautiful platform and if you, and we're going to do all the hard work if you want to sell apps here, but you're going to give us 30%, which is less than, you know, uh, Ingram microcharged when I was, sell you know, when you were selling s software in a box, they would take 50 or more percent. Yeah. Now, and, and actually in the Fortnite case, if I, if I recall the judge's decision correctly, they actually found that, you know, maybe there's a case to be made that Fortnite shouldn't have to use Apple's payment system. But that doesn't get Fortnite out of the thirty percent commission, um, you know. So, so like, fine, go ahead, use a different payment system, and you're going to have to pay Apple thirty percent. That was where, if I recall, again, the you know the judge's decision correctly, where that was, uh, where that was heading. Judge so got overturned by the ninth district, by the way, and they said, yeah, no, Apple, you don't have to do that. And you know, it's. It is complicated. I mean, I think pulling apart the payments, you know, it, it is conceptually interesting to pull apart the payments processing part of things from distribution, from marketing. But it's always been kind of a package deal that, like, this is what you get for the 30%. Now, is 30% the right price for every app, for every market, for every situation? Probably not. But No, and Apple's even admitted that. They offer... 15% for some subscription services and so forth. Right, like after the first year, yeah. you know. Yeah. By the way, and, I, again, know. for the second time on this show, I have to apologize. I uh, I uh, inferred that the phrase balls to the wall had to do with male genitalia. In fact, it has to do with the game Dodgeball. So <laughs> I just edit that all out. Go ahead. I don't care. Anybody wants to talk now. I'm humiliated. I'm going home. <laughs> well, we're, we're just going to take a 30 percent uh 30 <laughs> take, take a third of that of will you <laughs> yeah. yeah take a third of that uh please be my guest um i don't know i feel like apple uh so there is a certain amount of rent seeking in what apple's doing when they when they say to amazon you kindle app you've got to give us 30 percent of books you sell there or Netflix. You got to give us thirty percent of your sub subscriptions or Spotify, uh, and yeah, they cut it to fifteen percent. But uh, that seems like rent seeking. They didn't. Th that's not why people subscribe to Netflix. Is because you you made an iPhone or or Spotify or buy books on Kindle because you made an iPhone. That's not. Apple doesn't participate in that success and shouldn't. On the other hand, if if you make a a, a, a Wordle on the iPhone. And they're distributing it and they're promoting it. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that should be thirty percent. That's not an unfair amount. So I don't know. It gets hard though to you know to make an exception here and an exception there. Like you want you want to have consistent rules, and I think that's where that's where Apple, besides the rent seeking, which I think is absolutely a fair critique, I think Apple I think also wants to have a, a level, you know, 
a, lo- a consistent approach. Yeah. yeah. I think consistency though has been the challenge. I've spoken with with big developers like Facebook and Amazon, but I've also spoken with very small developers, including a, 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 a review site. They reviewed uh, iOS indie games and their contention is they used the term rent seeking and that they were essentially put out of business. Uh, and they, they argued that the Apple is not evenly applying their, their rules and that they would go after um, companies that, appeared to mimic or do some things that Apple did, but better. And that's maybe that's, that's, they were a little resentful, but I I can understand how maybe the rules weren't evenly applied and that that has generated some pretty ill will. Yeah. And, and the pandemic made some things weird because you had, uh, you know, like Airbnb had these these things called experiences. Like you go, you know, you go stay at an Airbnb and you take a pottery class. Well, Airbnb figured, oh, like, okay, well, now people aren't staying there, but the potter still wants to have students. So we'll sell a, you know, a Zoom pottery class. All of a sudden, Apple is saying that's a virtual experience and our in-app purchasing applies to that. Uh, whereas, you know, like they didn't charge 30% on the uh, Airbnb stay or the, you know, or the pottery class before. Yeah. Let's take a little break. Uh, I'm going to charge you all 30% for this next commercial. I hope you don't mind. The bill is in the mail. I wonder, by the way, what the Dutch regulators are going to do. Because Apple's clearly like going, yeah, okay, well, yeah. Uh, how do you like this? I have a feeling that the 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 Dutch regulators might have something to say about it. We'll watch carefully. Our show today brought to you by Our Crowd. This is a really interesting idea for people who, you know, and I want to emphasize this, uh, you know, you're, you're saving up for retirement, you're doing all the right things, but maybe you want to, you kind of watching all this excitement happen in Silicon Valley, all this money being made, you say, I kind of like to participate in this exciting world of, of startups. Here's the problem. Uh, you're not getting the information. You're not getting access to these companies at the right time. Once they go public, once you, yeah, you can buy stock, but but that's already after the exit. What you want to do is get in, as the big investors do on the ground floor at the beginning, so that when the exit comes, you can you can benefit from that. And that's what our crowd does. Our crowd is a venture capital firm that has what we call deal flow. They they know about what's going on in those little startup garages around the world. They analyze companies, look at the ones with the greatest growth potential, and then let you get involved. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to proton therapy, this is something new, a $20 billion total addressable market. In state-of-the-art labs and startup garages and everywhere in between, our crowd is identifying innovators so you can invest when the growth potential is the greatest at the beginning. And it works. Our crowd accredited investors have already invested over a billion dollars in growing tech companies. 21 of their portfolio companies are unicorns. Many of our crowd's members have benefited from over 40 IPOs or sale exits of portfolio companies. It is the fastest growing venture capital investment community. Let me explain a little bit about how it works. When you go to our crowd, dot com slash twit and please go there so they know you saw it here uh you'll tell them what country you're in and there are rules in every country in the u.s they call it an accredited investor a certain amount of net worth certain amount of experience they they don't want you to be you know uh betting the rent money here but if you're an accredited investor you can and again depends on which country you're in what those rules are so go there and sign up it's free to sign up by the way and get deal flow and find out what's going on it costs you nothing but once you see something you like, you can get in a single company deal for as little as ten thousand dollars. We're not talking millions of dollars, just ten grand, or get into one of their funds for fifty thousand dollars. But there is a and now you should know this a minimum of ten thousand dollars required to invest. But those terms again may vary depending on where you invest. So when you go to the site, input the country you're investing from. I'll give you an example though of some of the early stage startups you can get involved in. Right now you can invest in something called HIL Applied Medical. They're using Nobel Prize winning technology to bring the most advanced radiotherapy treatment to cancer patients. It's the world's first laser-based system that's earned them an agreement with Proton International, the largest proton therapy operator in the U.S., 
and Europe. Oh, interesting. So they were already kind of getting into gear, HIL Applied Medical. But find out more. You can invest in that and, or many other portfolio companies at O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash twit. But it, it costs you nothing to join to find out more, to read the prospectuses, to read the information, to follow what our crowd is doing. It's really fascinating. O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash twit. I'm not an investor, but I find it fascinating to read up on this stuff. And I think it's a really good idea uh, to give people access to stuff that normally only uh, people down there on Sand Hill Road get access to. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community, ourcrowd.com slash twit, O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash twit. Uh, let's see. Tesla's going to recall a whole bunch of cars because it turns out this is to me, this is a great story. Uh, they even said this when they talked about full self-driving that it would run some stop signs. Well, now, technically, that's illegal. We call it here a California stop in California. I don't know what you call it in uh, the Hudson River Valley, but it's called a California stop here. Uh, and the way Tesla did it, it's, and it's, I think, I understand how the engineers are thinking. Um, the Tesla, it says, looks at the intersection. There's nobody there. This is what you would do, right? And instead of coming to an energy inefficient full stop and start, it says, eh, I'm going to go through at, at up to 5.6 miles an hour, nine kilometers per hour. Um, so, okay, here's the bad news. It's against the law. <laughs> but I also understand exactly why Tesla did it. Now, you, you're you a consumer uh, reporter, Nicholas. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, well, I will preface this by saying I don't know a ton about cars, uh, so we'll say that. I'm not actually involved in the car team at Consumer Reports, uh, but I would say uh, I'm in favor of laws and following them. Uh, like, like you said, I could see the engineering mind being like, well, technically this is more efficient. Uh, sure, but like there are rules of the road for a reason. So I, 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 don't, I actually don't know how I feel about this. The Governor's Highway Safety Association says it is not aware of any state where a rolling stop is legal. But I bet you in Montana, come on now. Come on, man. You get to an intersection. You're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear the tumbleweeds blowing. There's nobody in sight for miles. You're not going to stop at that stop sign. You might slow down like the Tesla would, but you're not going to stop. I, 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 Maybe I'm like a very, like, we, I, I stop at stop signs. Even though in, you know, I'm a fairly rural area. I Do stop you stop? Do you come at full blink. stop? I do, actually. And I blink when there's literally nobody. I, oh, I'm turning right. I put my blinker on. I don't oh, know if I'm just you're like... You're a good boy. My, you're a good boy. I'm That's a goody two shoes on yeah. the road. I don't know. Uh, Tesla will know. have to recall a whole... I think it was something like 58,000 vehicles. Uh, there will be a over-the-air software update to turn this off. Um, Tesla agreed to the recall after two, not one, but two meetings with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, Tesla did say, well, there haven't been any, we don't know of any crashes or injuries caused by this feature. Model S sedans and X SUVs from 2016 through 2022. Uh, Model 3s from 2017 to 2022. Model Ys 20 through 2022. I think it's almost everything. <laughs> everything that was capable of it. Um, the firmware update will go out in early February, which makes me wonder why they have to do the the recall maybe that's the maybe that's what's going to fix it i don't know i was i was going to ask what does a recall even mean in the age if you of, could software you know, update right yeah i mean you know like fix the software problem it doesn't excuse you know tesla for allowing this to uh you know get out there in the first place but i i do wonder if you know we kind of have to rethink the 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 whole system of recalls because that's an enormous amount of expense to get you know get the cars back to you know a service center and you know and and for what for an over there update that you know you could get with the car just sitting in the garage yeah i wonder if it's just i mean this is totally speculation but uh i wonder if if using that language recall is just smart pr it's language that we all understand and yeah because it's really not can, yeah not yeah uh, yeah, they say recall, and maybe that's the, also that may be the legal term. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, right. 
but it's uh, recall documents posted Tuesday by U.S. safety regulators, I'm reading from the uh, AP, say that Tesla will disable the feature with an over-the-internet software update by uh, sometime this month. Uh, now, I had read it was two kilometers, but it is 5.6 miles an hour. So it is pretty fast going through there. And uh, AP interviewed a professor at Carnegie Mellon. He's a professor of electrical and computer engineering. He said, uh, four-way stop signs are commonly placed. We have them all over in California. Commonly placed to protect intersections for kids when no crossing guard is present. Uh, he said Tesla's machine learning system can mistakenly identify objects. What happens when FSD decides a child crossing the street is not relevant and fails to stop? This is an unsafe behavior and should never have been put in vehicles. Uh, I guess I agree. I do not do, by the way, I do not do rolling stops. I have family members who do. Uh, <laughs> but I, I like to stop. I, you know, it's a token stop. I don't like... I don't like sit there for a second. I come, but I come to a full stop, right? And I look around. And you should do the same. Otherwise, get your firmware uh, updated. So, um, wow. Have, has anybody purchased any bored apes? <laughs> wow. Uh, no. You know no. when uh, when um, around the time I started at. Uh, at protocol, we actually had to come up with a policy around NFTs. NFT. Yeah, um, you know, and, and we had a policy around uh, cryptocurrency, and you know, and uh, whether you could hold it, and disclosures that were needed. Um, but we struggled to figure, you know, figure out with NFTs, like if you have an N NFT, like does that give you a financial motivation to promote that? group of nfts or like ah, NFTs in general yeah. like what's it you know or mm. or if it's if it's really unique then you know it's just your you know it's just a you know like owning a piece of art doesn't give you a motive to like pump the whole art world right like you just think that your piece of art is you know is nice and worth whatever you paid for it well Tell that to Paris Hilton and Jimmy Fallon. This clip uh, on Twitter from I, I got, a recent Tonight Show. I know, I heard. I'm so happy I taught you what they were. You did. You taught me what's up, and then I bought an ape. I got an ape, too, because I saw you on the show with people, and you said you got a moon pay, so I went and I copied you and did the same thing. You did? Mm-hmm. And they this have... Is your, this is your mine. ape. Yeah. We debuted. That's, That's really cool. Paris paid, Hat are you ready? Three hundred thousand dollars for that bored ape, Jimmy Fallon's bored ape. Apparently, two hundred sixteen thousand dollars because what you do is you go back through the blockchain, and uh, at the same time as he said, "I bought one," there was this transaction for the ape that you know he has. So uh, that's half a million dollars. On by the way, you don't get the one and only copy of this art. Uh, what do you get? You get you could say I own it, and uh, you get a URL, and that's it. And it is, I think, if you're gonna. I mean, maybe I'm cynical, but if if you're gonna spend two hundred sixteen thousand dollars on that, it's not because you love it so much that it's or that you're so infinitely rich that it, it's like small change. It's that you hope to sell it on to somebody else for three hundred sixteen thousand, right? It's an investment. Is, it's speculation. So then to go on a tonight, by the way, 7 million people have seen that clip on Twitter alone. I don't know how many millions have seen it on the tonight show and say, look, look, <laughs> that sounds vaguely unethical. Am I wrong? See, to me, it's now I don't know. Anybody wants to defend NFTs, please do or Bitcoin or crypto or Web3. But I am increasingly of the opinion that it's all a scam. It's I, a I'm. <laughs> I yes. think it's you should disclose. I mean, I. Well, they said hold, they owned it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I speaking of, I, and I do work for my organization, so I'm promoting my organization. Uh, That's I'm true. I'm publishing a story That's tomorrow true. morning. Um, uh, interview, a short story, but an interview with Tim O'Reilly, you know, a famous publisher and technologist. He coined the phrase web 2.0. I think Tim had the first or one of the first commercial websites. And he uses really strong language about NFTs and crypto. 
Um, we have some video that we'll publish, but he's he. I don't know if he uses the word scam, wow. but he references the the trading back and forth of NFTs, which is pretty common to boost their value, and he does call it a pyramid scheme or that it's like a pyramid scheme. He was he was pretty um okay with the technology, you know, the underlying yeah, blockchain technology fascinating. blockchain. Yeah. Right. But but the use of it, he I mean, look, O'Reilly knows his stuff and he's a trusted person. He has uh, uh, I think he has a blockchain conference. So he has a lot of conferences. He has a lot of conferences. I think he had a blockchain yeah. conference. So he's not a he's not against blockchain. He's not a fool. Yeah, but, he's, but right. he's, no, he's no, not nor is he a fool. I think very, I really liked him a lot. There, I don't think he's against crypto or NFTs. I think he's he is smartly pointing out the the behavior around these products. I don't know that I would call an NFT or cryptocurrency actually technology. These are products that come from blockchain technology, but that these products have pretty scam like behavior around them. And if you go to the very top of well, I, I won't get into the pyramid scheme stuff, but it really, some of the behavior seems to be pretty similar to it. It, it did strike me that um, a lot of people who were buying NFTs early on were people who were very heavily invested in crypto. Now, if you convert your crypto to fiat currency, that generates a transaction that the, you know, that may or may not get reported to the IRS, but the IRS is definitely going to be interested in when you convert your crypto to an nft not as clear to me that there is a taxable mm. transaction that at least that the irs can kind of pin down um but uh you know i i kind of wonder if there is um some of that motivation of like you know this is basically a way we can get you know get our value out of crypto and you know out of a fungible cryptocurrency and into this non-fungible token. There's also a ton of wash trading, um, basically meaning trading like for like, which when it happens with stock, is, stocks is pretty suspect. So I think we have to look at that um, pretty carefully uh, in, in the NFT market. Well, and as Dan pointed out, there's uh, evidence now that uh, people are buying their own NFTs to get the price up. To kind of stimulate some interest in the end, I think Fortune magazine published a, yeah. a story. It's an, yeah. it's not my reporting. It's, yeah. I think Fortune's. Uh, BuzzFeed has discovered the guys behind the uh, board uh, chimps, the uh, the B Y B A Y C, the Board Apes Yacht Club, uh, and it's interesting. They've 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 attempted to be pretty anonymous, although they've now confirmed that that is in fact they are in fact the creators of this. Uh, a couple of liberal arts majors, writers, journalists, uh, and uh, they lived in Florida and they thought, you know, we should do this. They're not even the artists, by the way. Um, they thought eh, it'd be kind of, they were both in their 30s, met while growing up in Florida, according to BuzzFeed, and both had literary aspirations. They both were interested in crypto, wanted to create some sort of NFT collection, came up with the concept of rich apes living in a swamp clubhouse. So they hired a freelance illustrator to draw them, partnered with two engineers as co-founders to execute the collection, and they've been selling them. They have, this is actually, this is where you get the profit is. Uh, they make money not just from the initial sale, because remember, they didn't sell it direct to Jimmy Fallon or to Paris Hilton. Probably somebody bought it and sold it and bought it and sold it and it eventually got to them. They made $2 million from the initial sales of the NFTs, but they get a 2.5% royalty in all future trades. So every time that NFT is sold, they get 2.5%. So there is some, there is some money in this. Um, I don't, I don't think they're scammers necessarily. Uh, I don't think anybody's a scammer in this exactly, but I think you should consider the source when you hear people pumping up the notions of NFTs or crypto or web three because well, the, they might you know, have a vested interest in uh, in pumping it. Go ahead. The whole point is we did not know who these two uh, co-founders of Board Ape Yacht Club even were until Katie. They were not us. Yeah, yeah. You know, did that great reporting in BuzzFeed to to uncover their identities. Um, and she's gotten tons of criticism. People are saying it's doxing. She's doxed them. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh. yeah. I mean, it's just reporting. Yeah. But, no, and um, it's appropriate because uh, for accountability reasons, 
I think people should know who this is that's doing this. It's one there, of the, there, there, there is in the crypto culture this, uh, you know, kind of uh, sort of like in the gaming world, this idea that you have pseudonyms and that you have semi, you know, some semi form of anonymity. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, that's the whole point of blockchain, isn't it? Is that there's no central authority and uh, everything's recorded in the blockchain, but it's not recorded with your real name. It's recorded with your account number or your pseudonym or whatever it is you're using to identify your holdings. But someone There's, actually used the, the the blockchain to discover that a big uh, crypto project was being run by someone who had been involved in a previous scam. Yeah. Um, and they did all of that, you know, through blockchain analysis. Well, and that's how people like Mark Cuban defend it <laughs> in Katie's article uh, saying, well, look, this is all out in the public because it's in the blockchain. Everybody can inspect the blockchain. And, and you don't have to know their real name. You know their blockchain uh, reputation. It's an interesting point. Here's here's what Tim said, just a short quote. Um, when I hear a lot of people say, oh, there's so much money going into this, it must be valuable and therefore it's going to be successful. I actually have the opposite reaction when there's so much money going into it. And then he quotes the famous Upton Sinclair line, uh, you know, it's hard to convince a man of something when he's invested in it. I'm paraphrasing there, but um, we'll post the whole video tomorrow. His point was him seeing the web, the first web bubble come and go, the technology, the underlying framework of the internet, of course, was technologically sound. But the products that were built on top of it had so much FUD around them so or, or so much hype around them that it, it, caused this bubble and a lot of people got hurt in that bubble. And, and that's the underlying thing of what Tim is saying is that the tech is one thing, the hype is another thing. And that if this bubble pops, people could get hurt. Yeah. I can't wait. I, was, I, I, will, I will listen to that uh, or, or watch that uh, story tomorrow. That sounds really Yeah. I look forward to reading that, Dan, because that sort of like jives with my, like the tech is very interesting as, as you know, I've, People, it takes. It feels a little. Feels a little hypey. It feels a little. If Paris Hilton is on Jimmy Fallon, like look at this. Like that, my spidey sense is is tingling yeah. a little bit there. Yeah. Uh, but I will say, it's also interesting to see companies continue to like experiment. Like UFC just launched a bunch of NFTs last uh, last week or two weeks ago. They're very similar to the NBA Top Shot stuff. Top shots. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, EA said again a week or two ago that that you know, blockchain is not something they're actively pursuing. You know, after the previous quarter, they said they were pursuing. I would like to like just fast forward like maybe five years to see where all this and if is this is this just flavor of the month just like every marketer at an org is like we got to get involved in nfts because the kids are into it and it just ends up being nothing uh it, it feels again the tech is is super cool to me but it feels like this particular implement like i'm i'm super not impressed with like ape pictures on twitter like i'm sorry <laughs> like that's not like i don't know like even even you have the octagonal like oh because you pay for I twitter blue and you've, you've what? No, I just made an octagonal, cool. octagonal uh, profile exactly, picture yeah. and used it, and that's fine. I don't. <laughs> but on the other hand, if people get if if they feel if it if it like does something for them and they feel cool by having that, I also have no problem with that either. Uh, but it does feel a little hypey and a little uh, a little weird, I guess, as, as it as it currently exists. Reed Max, uh, Max Reed is his name. Uh, Reed Max is his Substack actually did a little digging and it's kind of interesting the uh interrelationships jimmy fallon is represented by caa which is by the way an investor in open sea which is the number one nft marketplace and also is representing nft collector zero xb1 who owns nfts from the board ape yacht club and another caa client austin kutcher also an investor in open sea uh, Kutcher, Kush, Kutcher is starring in a Netflix movie with Reese Witherspoon, who owns the World of Women NFTs, who happens to be married to a CAA agent. I think it can get a little bit uh, crazy. In fact, he's he's got one of those crazy maps that you tie the strings from here to there and everything like that. And I'm sure it's a little tongue in cheek, but it is kind of interesting how this and I have a few, you know these things happen in Hollywood and elsewhere in other communities where they they these trends burn through and everybody's oh I got to get one I got to get one um it just uh, you know I feel, I feel like maybe people should be cautious that's all just 
if it's if it's money you don't need, go ahead. But uh, there seems like there might be other things you could do that would be more useful. Um, boy, I'm wondering what Google's intentions are with Stadia. Uh, it seems like it's slowly winding down, while everybody else with their streaming gaming systems is just getting started. Uh, Stadia has apparently killed uh, their white label version. Um, business I insiders, that was the business. Yeah, I thought it was. Well, it wasn't initially, but then they pivoted. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, just another buyer beware, I guess. And speaking of why buyers, does, why go does Google need to be in in all of these lines of business? I mean, yeah, maybe not. You know, maybe. No? I mean, I think. I think their mode of uh, operation is, we'll just try everything and you know, uh, and kill it the minute it's not a good idea or not pro profitable, and that gives us a better chance of finding the next big thing than a company like Apple, which is saying, well, let's spend a hundred billion dollars on self-driving vehicles, and maybe that'll be the next big thing. I think Google's a little bit more like, let's let a thousand flowers bloom, but there's a downside to it which is the people who use Google services start to get a little worried that their favorite is going to disappear too. I think one of the issues with Stadia was always kind of the, the specific business model. It wasn't quite the Netflix of game, like compared to Game You had to buy the game. Yeah. You had to right. buy the game so that it never actually made sense. Like as a consumer, it's like, why would I do this? Uh, again, compared to Microsoft Game Pass, where I say, like, "Oh, that's just that's part that of my fifteen dollars a, lot of sense. a month." Yeah, it's it's bundled. I can play on my phone or or stream on my laptop. That that's kind of cool. I've used Game Pass uh, streaming; it works fine. You know, I happen to have a decent internet connection. Of course, that's kind of like you know that's the trick, right? If your internet is good enough or not. But uh, yeah, Stadia. Uh, I don't know. It, it had a weird how they structured that. Always felt uh, wrong, basically. Yeah. All right, let's take a break, and then we'll wrap up with a few uh, a few uh, shorties, little quickies. We've got a great panel. I'm so glad to have Dan Patterson here, cbsnews.com slash live. And we'll look for your interview with Tim uh, tomorrow. I think Tim is a smart guy, really interesting. I can't wait to hear what he has to say about all of this. Uh, at Dan Patterson on the Twitter, do you have a special super secret drop for people who want to give you tips or anything like that? No, just proton mail or email. Okay, there you go. That's all you need. Owen Thomas from Protocol, senior editor over there, doing great. Boy, I love Protocol. Give our regards to Megan. Megan Maroney's over Absolutely. there now. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything uh, you're working on you want to talk about? Actually, uh, speaking of money, uh, I have a uh, disquisition on the stock market dropping uh, tomorrow in oh. uh, Protocol source code. So Good. Can't wait. I'll try to, I'll try to make sense of it all. So you kind of have a newsletter. I do. My my you know my day job is senior editor of uh, of Protocol FinTech, which is now a daily newsletter. We're really excited nice. about it. About that five days a week. Um, and occasionally they let me out of my cage um, and write for Source Code, which is the flagship newsletter over here. Nice, very nice. I always enjoy your reading, your writing. I enjoy reading your writing, but not writing your reading. Because I don't write anything. <laughs> I hate writing. Also with us, speaking of writers, he is the senior technology uh, or electronics reporter for Consumer Reports, Nicholas De Leon. Great to have you, Nicholas. Thank what you, are Leo. what are you working on? Uh, yeah, I'm. It's funny. I'm actually working on a crypto thing now for CR that should be published uh, within the month, maybe. That's it's kind of a tricky thing to to do. Uh, if, if I may, if I could publish a side project, then we're, uh, I have a podcast. We talk about wristwatches, Seiko and Rolex news called the Hour Time Show. Uh, just a fun thing for if, you know, give me something non-tech related during the week to opine about. Uh, so the Hour Time Show. A is it, it. H-O-U-R or O-U-R? Yes. H -O -U -R. Howard, like a, like the hours of, Howard. The, of Howard yes, Time yes. Yeah, there Show, wristwatch review. Yeah, it's just a fun little side nice. thing. Nice. What are you what what are you sporting these days? What's on your wrist? Uh, I actually have on today. I just got this uh, from my. I have an or. I am not quite in Rolex money quite yet. Uh, but this is an Orient Bambino. Where's my camera? Uh, oh, 
Oh, Just kind of a fun little uh, I love wristwatches. wristwatch. Yeah. You know, it's sad because I only wear an Apple Watch now because of, I don't know why. It's, I, uh, yeah. But uh, I love wristwatches. Kevin Rose, of course, bought a, a Hodinkee. And, yeah, no, uh, I, I had a story in Hodinkee uh, in December about how the Apple Watch, like, was my gateway drug, so to speak, into, oh, watch, into knowing into about watch. Oh. I had no idea. I didn't know watches existed, frankly, until I got the Apple Watch and was using it. And was like, oh, it kind of, like, got the wheel, the the gear spinning or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, the, I I have the article in Hodinkee going into that. So, yeah, I, nice. it is. I wear the Apple Watch nowadays mostly just for, like, fitness stuff or like cycling or, or, or working out or whatever. Uh, it, it is nice to not have the constant like buzzing of, of messages and WhatsApp and all that stuff. Just to, just, just the time is good enough for me. So. Kevin, uh, I, I has so much more money than I do. He doesn't. I, so, you know, he's wearing these most amazing, beautiful, you know, hundred thousand uh, dollar wristwatches. And that, that's my problem with this. I love wristwatches. I think they're beautiful. But I'm in a t I'm more of a Timex guy uh, than a you know yeah. a Tech Philippe guy, and uh, but I wish I had you know at the same time, the idea of having something worth a hundred thousand dollars on your wrist it just seems unconscionable to me. So I don't know. I, I actually shouldn't say that that's how much Kevin's watches cost. But we did go to a dinner with him uh, at the French Laundry that was sponsored by some high end Swiss Swiss watchmaker, and they had a guy there with little magnifying glasses on a little hammer and he was a, he was building watches and filing stuff down it was like wild hand these things are handmade it's amazing yeah i had an editor in new york city about a decade ago who you know he would hold up a picture of the magazine and in the back there was invariably like a rolex or omega ad and he oh. was like rolex pays for all of your salaries <laughs> and as like a 25 year old i was like oh yeah i guess yeah, i'm a rank and file what do i know those watch companies uh spend money uh so very big, interesting. Big money. Big money. And oh, I, yeah. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway. Someday. But I, you know what? I can listen to the hour time show and I can get my watch fix. <laughs> at a, I have a, uh, uh, Lisa gave me, and it's a beautiful Cartier tank watch, which is a kind of very okay, classic, yeah, yeah. beautiful watch. Again, <laughs> she, she always says, <laughs> why, why aren't you wearing your tank watch? I said, well, I can't watch. It would look dopey to have two watches. That's a debate in the watch. Can you double wrist? Uh, no. Schwarzkopf did back in the day, if, if I'm not Norman mistaken. Or, uh, Norman or oh, Norman yeah, Schwarzkopf? Yeah, yeah. Norman Schwarzkopf. Yeah, Storm yeah, and yeah, Norman? Yeah, double, wow. Double, yeah, yeah. double watched. Yeah, yeah. He probably yeah. had one that was Iran time, Iraq time. and I don't remember. The, there's a couple yeah. photos of him. Uh, but huh. that is a debate in the community because then it's like, okay, then I'll wear the Apple watch and then like a, yeah. a, a, a real watch. So, I've been I, thinking I could probably wear the Apple watch around my ankle. It would probably work. I um, haven't tried it. CR hasn't tested it, so I don't know. <laughs> Test it, would you? Our show today brought to you by Nureva. Nureva, you've got the, you know, the huddle room, the conference room, the big one where you have people come in and stuff. And maybe you've looked at, well, how can we get the audio better? You probably had the speakerphone on the table, right? That's terrible. That's the worst experience ever. How can we get the audio better? So maybe you went and you talked to, uh, you know, a big audio technical firm and you know they said well you know we got to bring the designers in and we got to spec it out measure everything we got to do some echo testing and stuff like that and then we got to get the mics and they all they got to put them on the table when you got to tape of a mark where they are and oh by the way uh, because of covid protocols you got to sanitize in between meetings and there's going to be wires and there's speakers and we got a technician in there every few weeks cuz he's got to calibrate it this is not what you want but I have a better solution, a leap in technology that has transformed conference rooms. It's called Nureva, N-U-R-E-V-A. It's as simple as a sound bar. You could install it yourself. No wires, no microphones, just their patented microphone mist technology. The microphones are in the sound bar, but they work so there are no dead zones that it's as if there are thousands of microphones filling the room, virtual microphones. You can hear everyone everywhere, no matter what way they're facing, no matter how they're social distancing. You could just talk and move naturally, and you'll be heard by everybody, the remote partic participants. It's amazing. It's got continuous auto calibration. So there's, you know, your room is always ready to use with optimized audio. You don't need an outside technician. You can install it yourself. It's a 30-minute DIY job. Just hang. If you can hang a sound bar, 
a couple of screws and boom, you're in. You can do Nareva, which is going to save you a lot of time. And if you have multiple rooms, you'll use the Nareva console, which is awesome to manage the rooms. Gives your IT department the power to monitor, manage, adjust systems from anywhere. They don't even have to go to the room. They can just do it all from the console. Nareva is brilliant. It sounds great. It works. Saves you thousands of dollars. It's simple. It's modern. Ask yourself, you want to go with that costly, complicated, traditional system, or do you want to make the leap to simple, economical Nureva? N-U-R-E-V-A dot com. Find out more. It really is a brilliant solution. And as we get back to work, as we start having those meetings, some people are remote, some people are in office, you're going to really want to have this in your conference room. Nureva dot com. N-U-R-E-V-A dot com. We had a great week on Twit, we have prepared a small mini movie for your enjoyment. Like, we don't actually know if the Pixel 6 is their best selling Pixel device yet. It's too heavy. And it's, it's too premium, Miss Stacy, is <laughs> premium, not heavy. Yes. It's too heavy for my delicate floppy wrists. <laughs> Look. It has damaged oh, me man. forever. I'm, I'm not the grumpy one today. Two of you are <laughs> grumpy like crazy. <laughs> Grumpy? Previously on Twit, Tech News Weekly. There's the real estate market, and then there's the virtual real estate market. An upland is basically a monopoly game, but so instead of using a traditional game board, they use maps of real cities where you can then buy and trade. I just put in my own address, and it turns out that somebody had bought the address of my property in this game a couple months ago and was now renting it out. This week in Enterprise Tech. PC Mag started answering the big question. What is the difference between a VoIP and UCAS, which is Unified Communications as a Service? The bottom line really is the definitions are not real clear. All about Android. The Samsung Galaxy S21 FE. Always, as I recommend, make sure you have a case on them. Despite it being made out of plastic or glastic, uh, I recommend you have a case on it. And more importantly, supporting Big Mockadile. Twit. This is the year. Big tech is out. Yes. Big Mockadile is in. We should mention, by the way, speaking of Samsung, we will be covering Samsung's event this Wednesday. Uh, it is 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, so I'm making Jason Howell do it. Uh, he will come in, and uh, you can watch Samsung. It's expected they'll announce the S, I think, the S22, and uh, probably a stylus and maybe some other things as well. So Samsung Unpacked, Wednesday, February 9th, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, 3 p.m. GMT, 7 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, watch our live stream of that. And, of course, as with all of our live news streams, you can uh, you can then watch it uh, after the fact on uh, the Twit feed. If you don't like ads on this show or any show, you can watch them also on your ad-free feed as a member of Club Twit. I hope you are a member. If you're not, $7 a month gets you ad-free versions of all of our shows. You're paying us, so we don't have to advertise to you. We don't have to do anything. Uh, so get that. You also get access to the Discord, which is always fun. We have a really nice community in there. And Twit Plus Feed, which has uh, not only some of the shows we don't put on the air, it has material that's before and after each show that we don't uh, make a podcast out of. It has some unusual Shows like our Entitled Linux show, uh, which is getting its own feed. Stacy's Book Club, which is monthly and is really fun. Uh, the Giz Fizz with Dick D. Bartolo. And we just launched this week in Space Club. Twit members will get to hear that first because we want to give them a chance to uh, to start the show in a, in a friendly environment. So it'll appear only on Club Twit uh, at first, but eventually, of course, we hope to make it a, a public uh, show, uh, our newest show. And we can do that, by the way. It's an audio-only show thanks to members of the club. So please, if you're not yet a member, uh, help us do what we do best, which is make great content for you by going to twit.tv slash club twit. All right, one more thing. As long as, I've, as, long as I'm haranguing you, uh, we also want to encourage you to take our Twit audience survey. I said we don't track you. We don't. But from time to time, we like to get to know our audience a little bit better. Advertisers want to know. Uh, and, uh, of course, it helps us develop content more to your liking. 
It's our annual survey. Once a year, go to twit.tv slash survey 22 for the 2022 survey. Shouldn't take you more than a minute or two. Uh, and it really helps us. And of course, it's completely voluntary. So uh, you don't have to answer any question. You can skip them. You can not take the quiz at all. But if you do want to help a little bit, it's a great way to do that. Twit.tv slash survey 22. South Korea hacked him. So he DDoSed the whole country. Uh, Hermit Kingdom, he's a U.S. security uh, researcher. And uh, apparently he found out that the North Koreans, did I say South Korea? I did. I meant North Korea. There's, a, there's somewhat of a difference. <laughs> North Korea had hacked him and other, I guess his handle is P4X, uh, gone after him and other Western security researchers trying to steal their hacking tools, find out what they knew about software vulnerabilities. He says he managed to prevent them from taking anything of value, but he was so upset by North Korean state-sponsored hackers targeting him personally and by the lack of any visible response from the U.S. government. He said, <laughs> this is an article uh, from uh, Wired, uh, <laughs> Andy Greenberg writing, of course. He said, after a year of simmering, uh, he said, uh, I'm going to take matter into my own hands. It felt like the right thing to do here. If they don't see we have teeth, it's just going to keep coming. So uh, he said he looked into it, found numerous known but unpatched vulnerabilities in North Korea's systems. They, for instance, a known bug in uh, Nginx that mishandles certain HTTP headers. He found ancient, his word, versions of Apache. Uh, <laughs> he started to examine North Korea's own national operating system, the Red Star OS, which he described as an old and likely vulnerable version of Linux. He was able to single-handedly launch a denial of service. I don't know why I'm laughing, but I think it's, I'm laughing because it's great. Single-handedly launched a denial of service attack on the entire nation, partly because they only have a handful of routers connected to the, uh, the global internet. He said he largely automated his attacks, periodically running scripts that enumerated the systems still online and launching exploits to take them down. For me, says P4X, it's like a small to medium-sized pen test. <laughs> it's pretty easy, interesting how easy it was to actually have some effect there. And uh, so I don't think he took it down for very long. I think, as I remember, it was just a few hours. But uh, totally... Uh, took the uh, nation of North Korea offline. Cyber is asymmetrical. Yeah. Wow. I that's think what, what a story, huh? That's what's scary to me because you know if you look at the situation in uh, you know in Ukraine and uh, and Russia, uh, I mean, yeah, Russia. We see from satellite images that Russia is moving all of this military equipment and troops mm -hmm. in. What we don't see is what Russia might be lining up um, in the cyber realm, or what Ukraine might be preparing as a you know as an asymmetrical response. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of other security you know. researchers have also said. Maybe you don't want to mess with it because maybe uh, we have stuff going on that you might interrupt. So maybe just you know. It's not the right way to go. Um, oh. Yeah. You know, in other words, you don't want to ha them to suddenly harden their systems. <laughs> nah, law enforcement's always going to say that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I just, I like this story. And I don't like this story. BlackBerry has decided to sell all its patents to a non-practicing entity. Kids, we know what that means, right? Non-practicing entity. $600 million. I can't blame them. That's a good amount of money. Uh, they sold it to Catapult IP Innovations, which doesn't make anything or do anything. In fact, it was created specifically to buy these assets. So they brought in, I guess, investors. Uh, BlackBerry gets $450 million in cash, a promissory note for $150 million dollars. What does uh, what does I catapult IP get? The right to sue, and so uh, I think you're going to see uh, maybe not just maybe not you know what let's not let's that's judgmental. The right to charge royalties and then sue if they don't get paid. I, I'm surprised that you know 
Google, Microsoft, Apple, like, you know, why wasn't there a consortium of industry players who who came out and, you know, made a made a decent market clearing bid for it's a good Google's patents. done that before, actually. They've bought up old patents and said Motorola. we're not gonna uh, you know, we're gonna indemnify everybody, we're not gonna assert these patents. Go ahead, have at it. Um so should should we say shame on you, BlackBerry, or maybe we should wait and see? We'll see. It, it, you know, it, if you think about it, the patents were going to be with a non-practicing entity, one way or another, because BlackBerry is way out of the, <laughs> yeah. They don't do it. Yeah, the the mobile business. Yeah, they actually had licensed some of these technologies, so there's money to be made on it. Maybe it's just a license. Maybe it's just they're going to license make make money on licensing. Maybe that's it. I shouldn't assume. Shouldn't assume. But I agree with you, Owen. It would have been a smart thing to do for Microsoft, Apple, uh, Google, companies that make devices that use these patents to maybe just get together and buy them up. Um, let's see. Uh, North Korea. I think I've covered everything. U.S. Uh, has, or the House anyway, has passed a bill uh, to invest in chip manufacturing R&D. Uh, this is the America Competes Act of 2022. The Senate passed something similar uh, last summer, the U.S. Innovation and uh, Competition Act. So the bills will have to be reconciled. The uh, House version includes $52 billion in funding to help semiconductor companies build new factories to fund research and development. Uh, the president says he will sign that as soon as it comes to his desk. So uh, this is probably a good thing. Um, it's a it's a direct way to address the chip shortage, and encourage um, new factories to open in the U.S. It, it is, but I mean, the you know, on the scale of time that it takes to build a factory, is that really going to take a anything? while? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I do think it it is fascinating though the the ongoing chip shortage. Often, it's not the most cutting edge chips. It's these older chips that, you know, get embedded and, you know, do really simple functions like, you know, roll your window up or down in a car. And the fact that we're having shortages in those is um, is telling. Yeah, actually, a good article in Business Insider. Car companies stand to make billions by charging you monthly fees for adding features like heated seats. Unless they can't get the heated seats in, General Motors actually stopped putting heated seats in some of their vehicles because they couldn't get the chips. <laughs> right, because you need like a you know a temperature, you know you need a, a a thermometer basically to make sure that the heat doesn't get you know too high. Yeah, uh, and it's all of those little sensors, uh, all of those little electromechanical you know um, features that you don't really think about. Um, and yeah, a lot of manufacturers have taken the approach of like, okay, you're not getting power steering in, in your car. We in our uh, Twit community uh, forums, twit.community, I got a great message uh, from Cortex underscore M0 because we were talking about this and these legacy nodes and the heated seats. Uh, and he wanted to address this because we've also talked about how much Samsung spending seventeen billion to build factories, uh, Intel spending twenty billion to build factories in Ohio. We've talked about how the big chip guys are stepping up. TSMC. He said there's a, also significant investment in additional fabrication capacity for legacy nodes. TI TI is making a huge investment. Three new fabs under construction in the United States. One due to be online this year. One next. However, he says every vendor I hear from, I guess he must work in this industry, says their backlogs have no end in sight. The CEO of Swiss-based ST Microelectronics told analysts last week his company had about 40% more orders than projected capacity for 2022, 40% more than they can make. That's despite ST bringing on whole new fabrication plants in Lombardy, Italy. Also, despite the fact that he said in January that his company was sold out for the year. Other companies which have recently opened fabs include Infineon in Austria and Bosch in Dresden. I'm not sure if these are operating at capacity yet or if they're running at low capacity while setting up tooling and qualifications. Uh, thank you, Cortex, for that extra information. So, uh, yes, it is often these older chips, but uh, there, there, there's a response to that as well. So, um, but, but it may not be till eh, maybe next year. Maybe next year. 
guys, I'm gonna let you go. It's been a it's been a blast. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. I thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Nicholas De Leon from uh, Consumer Reports. He's their senior electronics reporter. It's funny that you mentioned you're going to do something on crypto. Because I felt like this morning on the radio show, I spent about 10 minutes just trying to explain blockchain, NFTs, and Web3. Yeah. So that people, Because people hear this, and I don't know, I think even for me, it took me a while to even understand what what's going on that's one of the hardest part of this article i don't want to give to it sorry about the article stuff but like just explaining all this like cockamamie stuff uh it magic internet money and like and like the uh, imagine you know it's easy enough to talk to like people who deal with tech every day but like for cr it is like the most mainstream audience like right. in publishing right and you uh, don't really you don't want you don't want to say to them you know <laughs> Even your dollar bill is made up. It's just a piece of paper, kids. <laughs> That's what I've tried in the past, and people just like it scares look at you. the hell out of them. They don't want to hear yeah, that. It's, yeah, it's it's very so. It's challenging, and you know, it's it, the only reason we're we're even doing this is people have asked. It's like, can you talk oh, about these topics? You know, there's and some by the demand. Way, out you got to do it in so. fifteen hundred words. So uh, get to work. Uh, yeah, I'm like double that. So oh, good. It, it's, oh, it's, it's a long it's, one. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's fun. I enjoy it. Uh, I, I think the topic is just inherently interesting. Again, like we were saying earlier, some of the products may be a little hypey or whatever, uh, but we wouldn't be doing it if folks didn't ask us to no, look at know. this stuff. Yeah. So. And, 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 and as, as you were saying, Dan, and I can't wait to hear the interview tomorrow uh, with Tim O'Reilly, but there is some very interesting technology here that probably is going to be around for a long time, like blockchain, in interesting uses. So it's important for people to understand that, too, I think. Dan Patterson, so great to have you. Technology reporter, CBS News. CBSnews.com slash live. <laughs> Don't forget. Uh, you Matt can, is. Now, do you have a regular time slot or anything? I mean... No, I do segments throughout the week. Uh, and I, I write stories. Um, so tomorrow I'm on in the 7.40 a Eastern hour. Um, but it could be the afternoon, evening. It's uh, when... Sometimes it's when news breaks. Other times it's when I have a story... Um, I am really glad it's, that CBS is taking streaming seriously because uh, I I've always thought CBS News was like the quality. It's it ever since Edward R. Murrow. It's the the Tiffany Network, and I uh, I hope that that standard still applies. I think it does, and we need it. So I'm glad that uh, that they're taking streaming seriously. This is obviously the future of broadcasting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We take streaming seriously. Yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat room wants to know, just a question. You don't have to answer it. Are you really tall or do you have a very low ceiling? I uh, know I have a, a lofted apartment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cause it looks like you're scraping the, scraping the ceiling yeah. there. He has big hair too, right? <laughs> That's, that is true. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, in a, no, uh, it's a low, it's a low, it's New York. What do you want? It's a, there's yeah, don't have room. They don't have room for it's high ceilings. It's very, very. It's a little island. There's not a lot of room. Thank you, Dan Spread. Great to have you. And of course, always Great a pleasure. You. Owen Thomas. I hope to see you at the theater someday soon. I think it's the last yes, time just, I saw you in person was at the Golden Gate Theater in San Francisco. That's right. Was it a uh, Hamilton night or? Uh... I, I don't remember, but you were with. I think you were with Ian Thompson, and you were just coming out. And we were just going in, and it was great to see you and. And I haven't uh, been to the remember, theater since. Remember theater. Remember theater, shows. Theater. <laughs> you know, Lisa and I were all set to go back to New York, and then they closed Broadway again. So oh. we're just gonna have to wait. Just have to wait. It's great to have you on. Thank you for being here. Protocol is thanks a for having very me. Very good publication. Protocol dot. Com. Thanks to all of you for joining us, by the way. We do Twit Sunday afternoons. We take all the week's news. We, we mush it up into a great big ball and then throw it at you. Uh, all you have to do to watch uh, live is go to twit.tv slash live. Or you can go to live.twit.tv. And, uh, and uh, we do that live stream about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 22.30 UTC. People will watch live, like to chat live. That's at irc.twit.tv. You can do it with a browser or an IRC client. doesn't matter. irc.twit.tv or in the Discord channel if you're a member of Club Twit. After the fact, every show we do is available on our website. Uh, for most of the shows, it's audio and video. Although, as I said, we're going to try some new audio shows, uh, which is cool. Twit.tv is the website. 
twit.tv slash club twit to sign up for club twit twit.tv slash store to buy mugs uh, or face diapers with the Twit logo on it, whatever it is you wear in the in the Yeah, we have really good looking masks. <laughs> uh, with all our, with the, like, you could have the Security Now mask, which I think would be a good conversation starter uh, to have Steve Gibson on your face. Uh, that's at twit.tv slash store. You have uh, two ways to interact with us after the fact. Uh, you can go to our twit.community, which is our uh, discourse forums, regular kind of forums, online forums. We also have a Mastodon instance at twit.social, kind of like Twitter for the Fediverse. Uh, there's a YouTube channel for this show and all the shows, so you can watch the video. Best thing to do would be subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you get it automatically. And if your podcast player allows for reviews, please leave us a five-star review. Let the world know you listen to the world's longest continuous-running technology podcast. 17 years, 17 years. We're going to celebrate an anniversary in April, right, John? It's 2015, 2005, 17 plus two, carry the four. I think it's 17 years. I'm pretty sure. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Another twit this is in the can. Bye-bye.